This episode, we're talking about magic. That's magic with a K. Yes, just like the skeptics, magicians love the letter K. Ah, we're already finding common ground. Well, that's what we do here at The Seeker and the Skeptic. (laughs) So today, we're going to talk about our experience at a candle magic workshop and delve into the world of magic. But I guess we should start with some definitions. So, Rebecca, what is magic? Oh, why did it have to be me? (laughs) This is so much harder than it looks. Like right. when you start digging into what magic is, you find that everyone has a different definition and each of those separate definitions are highly contested. Mm. So basically, well, as you'll probably notice when you download this podcast, we've spelt magic with a K. The reason we've done that is because this is what um, magicians, people who practice magic, do to differentiate it from stage magic. So we're not talking about like Penn and Teller or pulling rabbits from hats or anything like that. This is magic with a K. So that's just to start. Oh, and skeptic with a K is, that's a whole different thing, but it's basically because in the UK, we spell the word skeptic with a C instead of a K and it generally just means cynical. So skeptics prefer to use the K. Um, Anyway, that out of the way, (laughs) what does magic actually mean? It's kind of like, originally was invented as a sort of catch-all term for anything that violates the general understanding of how the world works. So once upon a time, um, do you remember these times when Christianity was the way everyone thought the world worked? Um, oh, yeah. Some of you, yeah, some of you may. 97 to 2004. <laughs> so there was a time when anything that was like not Christian was considered magic. Uh, nowadays, that's not really how it's used. Um, In fact, Roman Catholicism has been called more magic than religion by many Protestants. Uh, And now we kind of think of magic as being something that violates the scientific view of how the world works. Um, So basically, it's a really heavily loaded term. There's lots of people who would say what they do, as in what they do in their faith tradition, is religion. And what other people do is magic. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of anthropologists just think the term should be thrown out entirely because it's like it doesn't really do much good work. But luckily, as loyal listeners will remember, um, Alistair Crowley came along and gave us a definition we can all stand by. It's it's the best. It is genuinely the best definition. Okay. So do you remember it or shall I tell you? Please tell me. (laughs) The science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. Nice. Okay, so that's, that seems like a, a fair enough working definition, but it's still pretty vague. So here I've got a few examples of things that would count as magic by this definition. So say we're out walking on a really hot day. Um, I feel really thirsty. So my will, um, and you can go back and listen to the Alice Crowley episode if you want to learn more about the definition between the difference between desire and will. But let's just say I will to quench my thirst. And so I say to Kat, hmm, I'm really thirsty. And she passes me a bottle of water. As if. Is that magic? <laughs> okay, another one. Uh, Same yeah. situation. I'll give you four and then you can tell me which ones are magic. I will to quench my thirst. Um, I'm just walking along. Um, you don't have any water. We're just walking along together. Really thirsty. Um, I feel the desire, the true will that I really need to quench my thirst. And another passerby just offers us spontaneously a bottle of water to have a drink. Mm. Okay, scenario three. I will to quench my thirst. The desire to drink my thirst just entirely disappears. Just like that. Scenario four. I will to quench my thirst and a rain cloud appears in the sky and it drenches both of us. We tip our heads back and have a drink. Which, if any of those are magic? Um, I, I guess all of them. Exactly. By Crowley's definition, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Which is a bit problematic, I think. But I think there are also other things. I mean, because you, uh, you could start bringing in like synchronicity and, and stuff like that in. I'm not even yeah, sure. Yeah, does synchronicity count as magic? Yeah. I think this, this vagueness is actually um, very helpful in a weird way. If you want to avoid interrogating your belief, then yeah. having a kind of vague definition is really... And you remember when you spoke to Anthony, like street epistemology, um, and you can go back and listen to Kat's interview with Anthony Magna Bosco to find out more about this. It's all about getting clear definitions of what people actually believe. Right. And often you find the more clear you get about what you believe, the less certain you are that you actually believe it. And yeah, like the more bonkers it can get. Yeah, exactly. Well. 
Uh, so I came up with a definition that maybe we can use for the show. Maybe by the end we'll have adjusted or whatever. But I'm thinking magic is ritual actions. So that could be words, thoughts, or manipulations of objects, you know, incense or whatever, which are thought to create change in the physical world by supernatural means. Yes. And I wonder if it's specific um, changes, right? Because you can't just do a ritual. Something happens, but it's like, actually, I didn't really intend my ritual to do that. Yeah. That's so like, that's like you didn't do the magic right. So ritual actions, which are th thought to create specific, like intended change, thought to yeah. create intended change in the physical world by supernatural means. Yeah. Does that sound fair? And then we can, you, me asking you for a drink, that doesn't count as magic. Someone spontaneously offering me a drink. We don't know if that's magic or not because we don't know if they were compelled to offer it for magic or just by looking at me and seeing I was thirsty. Stopping experiencing the thirst, I would say is not magic because it's psychological. You, did, you didn't do a ritual. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah. If you did a rain dance and the fourth one <laughs> happens, yeah, okay, that's yeah. magic. Okay. But this just illustrates how complex this is. And I have another quick question for you before we move in, on away from definitions. I could do a whole show on definitions, as you know. <laughs> but um, we should eventually get to actually talking about the subject. Is prayer magic? Um, it, it, depending on how, what you pray, like uh, praying for like benediction, praying for something. Yeah. But if you're just praying like, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's magic. <laughs> so I think it, it's like if you're willing something in your prayer, which is a valid form of prayer. Yeah, because I'd say God is a supernatural means. He's not natural. He must be supernatural, sure, right? Sure. So I guess the, the only thing I was thinking, maybe people would say it has to be, you have to do it yourself. You can't be asking someone else because with God, you're like, oh, could you please make this happen? Whereas with like I, other I, magic, it's more direct. No, I disagree because so much magic is you're asking for like the gods. You could be doing, you know, um, planetary magic maybe. I don't really know enough about that, but like um, if a lot of magic used to be your kind of like prayer, but you're asking gods or spirits or demons to do something for you. So I think that still counts. Okay, cool. Sorted. So that's I, our I definition know, of magic. I get so opinionated about this. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, anyway. So where, where are you at on this? Where, as a seeker, how do you approach the topic of magic? How were you yeah. feeling before we went to the class? I mean, honestly, this is one thing I have never really taken seriously um, <laughs> until, you know, until we start the seek and the skeptic and then I turned into like <laughs> a crazy person. <laughs> so basically in the last year or so, I'd say that I'm um, coming into contact uh, via astrology with people who do take magic very seriously and who aren't stupid um, and who I respect. I did have to think twice about um, the place for magic beyond like being seven year olds and like playing witches no offense to witches <laughs> um and all of your talk about magic as a teen made me more curious and it sounds like fun and um i also used to really i mean i'm sure i've mentioned it before and it wasn't a big deal but like you know i was very much into the secret abraham hicks vision boards uh, and basically spending my whole life trying to get stuff um so <laughs> in that way like um maybe there's an appeal there in just being like oh, i could like do things to, to get more stuff but equally that's also waning as well um and i can get more into that later but yeah i was definitely just up for exploring magic specifically from the position of um ritual action i think that there's something really um important about ritual whatever our intention is not whatever, but like there are different intentions for different rituals, but I wanted to wear a cool hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the hats. That's why you got so Thelema as well, isn't it? Exactly. So what about <laughs> you as a skeptic? Oh, well, as a skeptic, I think it's all nonsense. But as someone who used to be Wiccan, <laughs> um, I have um, a slightly more nuanced perspective maybe than the average skeptic. So like you said, I did a lot of magic when I was a, in, a teen and in my early 20s. Um, I'm one of those people who's very drawn to ritual. Mm -hmm. Just like, I think this is something, I don't know whether it's like a, you know, OCD, that's obviously a terrible condition for a lot of people that they suffer with. But I suspect that like a lot of kind of, you know, psychological stuff, there are people who exhibit like milder traits 
um, through to people who don't care about ritual at all, to people who have to do this ritual or they believe all their family will die. Um, so I, I see it as like, it's a personality trait which can go really wrong at the end. Mm. And I have no understanding of psychology, so that might be wrong, but that's just how I think about it. And I think that I've always been drawn to doing little rituals and that's probably part of what I loved about Wicca, doing rituals. The sort of understanding I had of what I was doing when I was doing those rituals. And they were always like, well, they weren't always positive actually. I was gonna say they were always nice, but they weren't always nice. Um, was that I was tapping into some kind of energetic web. This is how I thought of it. Like there's this energy that's like floating around um, and you can't access it through science or any normal means, but you can access it through um yeah but through focusing your intention through ritual behavior and then you can make stuff in the world happen you can see how that influenced my definition yeah. of magic right um so for an example i'll give you an example of something bad i did because it's more interesting um i had a boyfriend and he was always going on about this woman at work uh just you know you know what it's like just it was just too much like too yeah. many mentions of this woman's name and i started to get a bit jealous I think, I can't even remember what she looked like, but obviously I felt that she was a threat. And so I did a spell to banish her um, <laughs> with my friend. So it's his fault too. We got together and I can't remember exactly what we did, um, but I think there was probably a bit of candle burning, a bit of saying her name in a loud, aggressive way, <laughs> a bit of like maybe tying some knots, uh, doing cutting some stuff up with scissors. Because um, we used to make our own rituals and this is like, uh, what a lot of Wiccans end up doing. You learn the basics of how magic works and then from then you just sort of make it up as you go. Um, and lots of people will tell you that it works better if you do it that way. Anyway, so we did this ritual. I wish I could remember more details. And then like a couple of days later, she got fired from her job. Fuck. Yeah. And I felt so guilty. <laughs> Jeez, I think I we should just drop the mic. Magic works. <laughs> it's probably because uh, she was spending too much time flirting with my fucking boyfriend. <laughs> Instead of working. I didn't mess with Rebecca, guys. What the hell? Um, That's really interesting. So I did lots of um, little spells like that uh, for all sorts of things, mainly nice things. Um, and every time something happened that seemed to, you know, seem to be a result of my spell, I believe that's because the magic worked. And every time nothing happened, I just forgot about it forever. So that, that's how I maintain my belief in magic. That's the classic confirmation bias. I'm not saying I did that consciously, it's just how it happens. Um, and then obviously I gave that all up when I became a skeptic uh, and started seeing the world in a much more, you know, logical way. But I still am really, like I say, I'm a ritualistic person and I'm quite open to the idea of magic as like, you know, something, maybe a way of using ritual to make yourself feel better, um, yeah. to cheer yourself up or to calm yourself down. So yeah, I'm on the fence about it basically. It's really interesting. I'm not sure if we'll get into a deep enough discussion about it, but I mean, ritual itself is so fascinating. And I, I struggled then. I couldn't actually put it into words why ritual is so valuable to me. Um, I'm working on it. Mm. It's a, we should definitely need to do a whole show about ritual because yeah. it's, it's a fascinating... I read an article, a Scientific American article, I'll put a link in the show notes, about the... Um, I think it was Scientific American, uh, about the importance of ritual and how, it, yeah. how it's... Like so many simple things, like having a bath as a ritual. Sure, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All these little... Like put, you put your music on, maybe you have some special bubble bath, you might put some candles on, like mm -hmm. all these things that people do that they don't think of as being ritualistic behaviour are... And they are really good for changing moods. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, and also I love the aesthetics of it. Oh, yeah, we'll get I love the, the candles and all that stuff. So I was really looking forward to this workshop. Yeah, and so we, we chatted about the workshop immediately after um, the experience. So we're going to play that conversation for you now and then be back with all of the tabs open in our browsers <laughs> and get ready for some research. So me and Rebecca met uh, to go to a bookshop in London called Treadwells, and that's where the event was held. And this was such a cool bookshop, wasn't it? It was like one of those, uh, it felt really a culty, little magic-y, out of the way, spooky. Completely. And I think the thing that I was pointing out to you was uh, one of London's best coffee shops was nearby. <laughs> and that's how I knew it. I'd actually walked past this bookshop many times. And maybe you have too, if you're from London, and maybe not really gone inside. but. Um, we had like five or 10 minutes to spare. So we got to look around all of the different uh, books, which are all great 
ideas for future episodes of The Secret of Skeptic. Yeah, almost immediately we're lifting up books and going, let's do a show about this, let's do a show about that. I think there's like a whole bookshelf about Alistair Crowley, which is Yeah, amazing. and it's like just books right up to the scene. I love bookshops and I don't get to go to them enough anymore because yeah. now I'm a Kindle gal. But um, yeah, the book's right up to the ceiling, really densely packed. And every single shelf is labelled something strange, like a strange occult word that you haven't heard before. Yeah. Apart yeah. from like the occasional thing that we recognise, like Thelema or Druidry or things that we've already researched. Yeah, and what I didn't know was that this place hosts events like all the time and they sell out really rapidly. Um, yeah, we booked this one way in advance. So we booked it a couple of months before, I think. Yeah, and I think we had just been looking on Eventbrite uh, which just has you know all kinds of events. But if you were to go on the Treadwell's website, you'll just see um, some really interesting things. And yeah, they also have, I didn't know if you we looked on their website, but all of these, uh, what do you call them? Like special edition books, like hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Yeah, I was, was it in the, we walked past another occult bookshop whilst we were in London that day. Um, and it might have been that one, but I saw a Alistair Crowley book. Signed. The famous picture, and it said signed, and I was like, oh my God. But it was signed by the author, not by Crowley That's himself. so disappointing. <laughs> I don't even think he would have signed it. I think he would have done something really weird and probably a bit gross to those books instead. Yeah, and sticky pages. <laughs> anyway, so then at the time, we went downstairs to their little like workshop room, which was very unmagical in my opinion. Yeah, it was disappointing. I was really thinking it was going to be like wood, like big wood desks. Like kind of, I was imagining like a science classroom. Like, maybe. Oh, I, I thought you were imagine, I was imagining Hogwarts. Oh, I think I was imagining like the, um, the magic shop in Buffy. Oh, nice. Yeah, way better. I thought there would be more books down there. I thought it'd be candlelit maybe. Yes. Some like throws, that sort of thing. Some skulls. But yeah, it was very utilitarian. Yeah, and like really, really bright lights. So the whole thing about like candle magic and you know it, that whole atmosphere that you can create with candles which is something that she kind of started with do you remember this uh Lucia? yeah that's kind of how she kicked the whole thing off so lucia starza is the name of our teacher um she's she started by talking about how candles everyone acknowledges that candles have something a bit special about them we don't really need them anymore in our lives but people use them to evoke atmosphere mm -hmm. and that in itself is a kind of magic which i thought was a nice place to start from yeah and the fact that we are kind of doing magic with them all the time, like when you're a kid and you blow out the candles on a cake and make a wish. Yeah, thought that it's was kind a really of like good a point. Spell. Yeah, uh, and she's so written sitting... some books as well. Yeah, several. In fact, we'll put a link to um to her blog where you can find all of her. She has a blog called Bad Witches Blog, um, which is apparently all like I had a quick look at it, um, but it doesn't really have an about section. So I didn't find that much about her, mm, uh, but it has like all upcoming events in London and a few articles about different spells you can do and stuff like that. But the interesting thing was the other students or one of the interesting mm. things, because sitting at these kind of, as I say, very utilitarian. So like school chairs and sort of school tables, we had about 17 people, I think. Mm. And uh, only two of them were men, which is not too surprising. Um, uh, but what I found surprising was that the women were all mainly older than us, I guess. Yeah, I was trying to remember like what was the age range. And I would say that the, the couple would have been younger than us, but maybe nearly everyone else is either our age or a, a bit older, but not super old, basically. Yeah, but I was expecting it to be all like teenage witches. In, yeah, yeah, I thought there'd be more like a millennial vibe. Because I don't know, um, I just feel like Wicca especially is becoming such a big thing amongst all the kids nowadays. Yes. But maybe they can't afford to come into London and go to a candle magic workshop. Yeah, I think it was about 30 quid, um, you know, mm. something. But was like, it really 30 quid? I think so. Oh, each? Yeah. Do you not Whoa. think it was worth it? <laughs> well, we'll get to that at the end, I suppose. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm surprised... <laughs> surprised to hear that I, you know how tight i am with money i'm surprised i spent 30 quid on this <laughs> what were you, it doesn't sound like you just me got at like all swept up in the idea of doing magic on a yeah. on an evening um but yeah so so i was trying to kind of like categorize like what kind of genre did these people fall into and honestly like i felt like other than some like outliers they're pretty much like us yeah. i mean some of them were in covens how do you say it Coven yeah yeah two of them were on their um 
well, they're not in covens yet. So traditionally in the Gardenian tradition, which is the tradition derived from Gerald Gardner, go back to our Wicker episode, listeners, <laughs> if you're not keeping up. Uh, yeah, so in the Gardenian tradition, you do coven training for a year and a day. So you like embark on your training. And that usually involves like a big, long reading list of books you've got to read. Um, regular meditation practice, acknowledging the festivals, like the coven will set nice. up like a bunch of stuff that you have to do during that year. And then after that year and a day, you will be initiated into like, sometimes it's the first degree or sometimes it's just you're allowed to start the first degree. Wow. There's several degrees. It's kind of like the Masons, you know, because Joe yeah, yeah, yeah. was involved in all that stuff. Oh, so, I love it. I love the anyway, year and yeah, a day so yeah, I know. It's beautiful. So there were two people doing that traditional training, which was very exciting for Lucia because she's a Gardenian witch. And she was like, oh, it's so lovely to see you young people doing it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, a lot of people, though, w were like, oh, I'm just not very experienced. I'm just kind of curious. So, oh, yeah, listeners, this is a funny thing. Um, obviously, we had to do the classic thing of introducing ourselves, saying a bit about why we're here. And, and they had badges I, as well, which we was did completely unnecessary and weird. Like we had to write our names on a little um, bit of paper and then put it in a little plastic holder and pin it to our tops. It's quite a good idea if you're holding a workshop. But yeah, anyway, um, so I was like, I, I didn't really know what to say. So I kind of started talking about astrology. It seemed, seemed to be like, oh, here's <laughs> an appropriate place for me to talk about this. And, you know, she was, we'll, we'll come to that. But that, that wasn't that odd to talk about astrology in, in this way. And then they got to you and you were like, oh, Kat just drags me along. <laughs> yes. But throughout the night then, um, basically <laughs> I'm asking Rebecca all of these questions, like, why is she doing this? What does this mean? And she's like spouting off all of her witchy stuff. <laughs> just that I don't know very why funny. I said that. It was really weird. I think No, I think that's a stock answer, which actually is more, it's because it's hard to true. say I'm I'm a skeptic mm, I was like mm. running I hate those introduce yourself things yeah and the whole time whilst everyone else was introducing themselves I'm running through what I'm going to say yes. and I thought I was going to say something like I'm really interested in the psychological aspect of magic uh and I was ready with that answer but then when I opened my mouth I just was just like I don't know cat made me come it's so funny it's almost like the opposite of uh, the witch hunt this is like the skeptic hunt and maybe yeah. you're, instead of being scared that they'll find you out that you're a witch it's like no they're gonna find out that you're a skeptic <laughs> yeah and I don't want people to feel awkward or like intimidated or they can't be themselves sure. because yeah. I'm the skeptic there and also yeah I don't want to be burnt at the candle magic class they've already oh, got all this so fire funny. going on <laughs> I love it um so she began in I think apparently the classic way that you start a uh, ceremony right yeah by drawing a circle so she lights this little lantern, a beautiful little lantern, and then walks clockwise around the room, or diesel, as the witches would say. Uh, diesel is clockwise, Widdishan is counterclockwise. <laughs> I don't know where these words come from. Um, I could probably find out. Anyway, and she says, while she's walking around, by the flame of Avalon, I cast my circle. And we're like, hmm, don't know what that's all about, but uh, we found out later. Uh, yeah, so it didn't really feel... But I think because it was a well-lit room yeah. and because she was like having to climb over people's um, bags like, and yeah, and cords, like people have plugged in their phones into the wall. So she had to like go round or over or like, it, right. just, it didn't feel like she was creating sacred space. No, no, it didn't. And she didn't really say much. It was just like by this flame of Avalon, you know, she didn't call the corners. Is that, that's no. the other thing? Nothing Good like point, that. Cat. Yeah, <laughs> well <I'm spotted>. learning. <laughs> I had no idea what the point of the compasses were whilst we were in that room. It was terrible, uh, terrible yeah. witchcraft. I had, to, I had to get my phone out, out that will tell me. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I mean, her blog is the bad witch blog and she had this kind of like very uh, kind of casual attitude the whole way through. Yeah, I really like that. So just a c couple of comments on her. Um, I was really happy, especially at the beginning, to be like, oh, she seems so down to earth and sweet. And also, like, she, she, she knew her stuff, mm. but um, she kept saying that you kind of have the traditional approach and you have the intuitive approach. And, and I, I appreciate the traditional stuff, and I do that when I'm in um, ceremony with other witches, but uh, I work on my own. I work a lot more intuitively. Fair enough. Quite like that. Yeah. And it's quite, it's interesting because I think we noticed this in lots of these things that we've done lately. Um, you can have lots of different people with lots of different beliefs and ideas in their head about the practice, but they're all working together. Like they're all doing the same thing, but one of them believes it's literally true. One of them believes it's mm. more of a metaphor. One of them believes that, you know, actually there is some kind of like actual Christian type God. And this is all like, and some, like everyone's got these different beliefs, but they're coming yes. together to do the act and it almost doesn't matter 
the the practice is more important than the beliefs yeah that is a really interesting part of this and something that i've been um not struggling struggling to grasp myself but i'm just naturally curious about that underlying belief system it's when i was at that astrology conference last year i was like yeah but what do you guys really believe like let's talk about that i don't really care about what house system you use i actually want to know what are the underlying beliefs about all of this not everyone's interested in that though no, not interested in, in some, I think it's, I think this is just a general thing within the neo-pagan community. People are cagey about talking about their beliefs because they're, the value that they, they have, what are their biggest values is inclusivity. Mm. And as soon as you start talking about your beliefs, you're like saying, well, this is what I believe is true, which kind of starts to negate other people's beliefs. So they will, huh. they're like deliberately evasive on talking about their beliefs because they don't want to make anyone feel alienated, which is um. kind of nice. Yeah. But it means it's really hard for us. We're trying to research and find out what these people believe. And no one will tell you what they fucking believe. Yeah. And just personally, I, I, I'm, yeah, definitely inclusivity is great. But I think naturally both of us, part of our values are we like to have those conversations, even if we disagree. Yeah, um, I think it's, I, um, my theory is it could be because so many of these people were brought up in more traditional religions. Sure. And the thing that they hated about the religion of origin was that it was, you know, that it was mean to certain groups of people, like gay people or whatever. So yes. they don't want that to happen in their groups. They've just gone to the absolute opposite extreme, whereas like, it doesn't matter what you believe. Yes, yeah, so everyone is welcome, it. no matter. In fact, I was with a Druid group the other day, uh, chatting to them, and some woman said, what's really nice about our group is that anyone can come and we can have talks with them about our spirituality and stuff. And it doesn't really matter if you have completely opposite ideas. For example, I, this guy came once and he seemed to be like really far right politically, but we could still sit down and talk about Druidry. Right. And I was like, that's really interesting, kind of admirable, but also mm. kind of, kind of a bit weird. Like, are you really going to brush like that yeah. sort of stuff under the rug? It's, it is it is really interesting. I, I mean, I definitely think that's probably the right way to do things. And I do like this idea of um, like breaking bread with people of, of different belief systems, because we can all agree that like food, for example, is a good thing. Yeah. Most of us. Yeah. And I mean, that is exactly what our show's about. Yes. So yeah. We break bread together all the time. Exactly. <laughs> so um, should we talk about the first spell we did? Yeah. The tea light spell. So we had a little bunch of stuff out on each of our tables. So we're all at, uh, was that like six tables with uh, like four people at each table? There were four like tables, that. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, okay. I said something I, like. I don't remember a lot of things, but when I do, I'll let you know about them. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so we had at our table, um, we had, yeah, three other women, right? and us and uh in the middle of the table there's some tea lights and some beautiful uh colored candles mm -hmm. spell candles as they're called for yeah use later. i didn't know that was a thing did, did uh, you know about spell candles yes i've seen them in fact they were selling them upstairs we walked right past them on our way down cool um and then some weird pots with uh what looks like oil of some type mm -hmm. in them uh, so she tells us each to grab a tea light and talks us through doing a very simple tea light spell which i mean it almost doesn't need explaining because it's so simple. At least I think so. Oh, it totally wasn't simple. Guys, it had multiple steps. You don't <laughs> just light the bloody tea light which, and like make a wish and blow it out, which is what I wanted to do. You take the waxy bit of the candle out of the holder. Um, you carve into the candle one word, was it? That kind yeah. of, you know. So the idea is to think of what you want, like your wish, I guess, and then simplify it down into one mm. word, which you then carve into the candle. What was yours? I, I like it's embarrassing. Like, go on, tell me anyway. I want a soulmate. Oh, <laughs> and a lot of people were asking things like, only one word? Can't I have more words? And I was like, yeah, I know. I just want to like explain it fully so I don't get something that I don't want. Yeah, it's you funny because she did say you have to be careful to wish for, like, because it could backfire. Yeah. So, but then also you have to simplify it down to one word. I think, so did you end up carving soulmate? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine. Oh, but yeah, you but could that's like one word. It. No, but like, um, I was wondering, like, <laughs> can I ask other things like soulmate who I actually like? Or like, I have to like, like no. them and stuff like that, no, you know? That's it's too like, much. Nope, you just get someone. It's like, and I want them to, you know, like all of these specifics, like, and they have to be like alive and stay alive for a while. And, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm overthinking this. Carving that into the candle, we used um, the end of a matchstick, which I thought was genius. 
and it worked surprisingly well i was yeah. a bit skeptical when she was like just do it with the magic as i was not gonna work but it worked fine yeah it did and um yeah and like a bit of visualization but not yeah, overly so- like there you're supposed to that. yeah not enough i'd say <laughs> you're supposed to visualize what it would look like if the spell worked yes um concentrate that and then whilst you've got that in your mind you light it yeah and that was a nice moment like what's so cool about how she designed the workshop i thought it was really well planned out but we kind of just kept leveling up i think on a lot of the different um spells we were doing yeah, so the the we only really did one spell over the whole evening, but it, like we improved it. Yes, exactly. As we went. Yes, yeah. So that next step was talking about correspondences. Yeah, the, this is a whole interesting con- uh, concept. In, I love this. I mean, bit. it's in all occultism and uh, and Wicca and all of these things. Uh, basically, most books, if you pick up a book about spellcraft of any type, or just a book about Wicca that has a section on spells, which most of them do, you will see lists of correspondences. And they're sometimes, I mean, correspondences is like the old fashioned way to call them. Sometimes they don't even have a name what they are. It's just like- Associations. M- yeah, associations. So Monday will be linked to a bunch of things. I wonder if I wrote it down. Okay, here we go. This is from her sheet that she gave us. Um, it had all the days of the week and then it had the correspondences for that day of the week. So Monday, the planet is the moon. The color slash metal is blue. There's in brackets, you can use white or silver. Deities are Diana and Artemis. And the correspondences are woman's mysteries, illusion, glamour, sleep, peace, beauty, prophecy, dreams, emotions, travel, fertility, woman's health, insight, and wisdom. Yeah. And we went through all the days of the week like that. And I mean, I love that because this is what we do with astrology. You know, this is like, if you know you're kind of doing that with the planets anyway that they have all of these correspondences um so that was fun it's really interesting though because it's like um is it seems kind of random like you just you open the book and you'll see the list and some of them kind of make a vague sort of sense to you so you're like maybe you think monday oh that's the beginning of the week so that should be about new growth or something and sometimes that's appropriate and sometimes they just seem like I don't know why they someone's s- made that connection. Well, I think with this one in particular, all of those correspondences in terms of the words, they were all related to the planet. Like everything mm. comes back to that. It's not like Monday is the beginning of the week, so it would be new beginnings. It's like, no, Monday is the moon. And so it's to do with like travel and intuition and things. But why is the moon linked to travel and intuition? Well, travel, it's like, it's the, the quick moving thing in the sky and it's always changing. It's like, Fuck. Like, something <laughs> like that it's it's quick moving it's clearly traveling right yeah yeah i guess I, i'm then, just saying yeah. that some of them some of them seem like you can immediately understand why they're, they are the way they are and some of them sure. are a bit more random i was reading on the way into london that day i was reading this great book called the seven laws of magical thinking by matt hudson which i would recommend to our listeners especially if you're more on the seeker side because it's not it's explaining all the different psychological mechanisms that happen that give us kind of the magical thinking but it's not in a derogatory way Mm -hmm. and in fact he is in favor of using magical thinking sometimes and thinks it can be used to people's advantage i'm not fully sold on it but it's a really interesting take interesting approach to this sort of book uh but he says he talks about the law of similarity who's james fraser you know that old anthropologist type guy who wrote anyway it doesn't really matter he came up with these ideas about how how magic worked and one of them is the law of similarity which is basically we think that if something seems linked in our head like if we think the moon is linked to travel because it moves across the sky like you were saying like that's an associative link that human beings make and then on top of that we think oh so it must be causally linked because Mm -hmm. it's intuitively associatively linked we assume it must be causally linked and this guy um matt hudson he said um i've never heard this before but i think it's kind of really plausible is when we feel that there's a link between say travel on the moon but we know that there's not really like so he he separates these things into a leaves and b leaves um, so, cool. so an A leaf is like you feel something's true mm. and a B leaf is that you know something's true yeah yeah um, and I think it's a really useful distinction because we often get tangled up talking about what we believe and if you separate them into two things anyway so he says basically you have an A leaf 
that the moon is connected to travel because it sort of it feels associatively like it might be true true but we know logically that they're not connected yeah so now you have a a cognitive dissonance situation where you're believing two contradictory things at once you believe that they're connected and you believe that they're not so you have to come up with a way to resolve cognitive dissonance Mm. and we all know the only ways to resolve cognitive dissonance are to change your beliefs people don't like doing that very much um to drop one of the beliefs or to come up with a sort of justification yeah and the like justification adding. yeah is the law of similarity that's why people come to believe in the law of similarity because it solves that problem because it's very hard to hold these two opposite ideas they're connected but i know they're not connected so how do you solve that problem you come up with a theory the theory is the law of similarity things that are associatively linked in our minds must be causally linked and that's like one of the basic principles of magic um i don't actually fully understand the law of similarity what do you mean by that? I still. I mean, I, if I something missing. like, for example, a rose is connected in my mind with love because it's yeah. like a traditional romantic gift to give a rose. So I can believe that I, be, I believe that they're linked in my head, imaginatively yeah. linked. But I don't believe that a rose is actually linked to love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. law of similarity says that a rose is actually linked to love. And if you oh. pick a rose and like meditate on it or concentrate on it, it will somehow increase love in your life. Whatever. Yeah. So in that when that in that way you're kind of merging A and B, like an A leaf becomes a B leaf. Exactly. Yeah. But I would say that there's also like a third thing that people do, which is creating almost like a third belief, um, mm. maybe a more fundamental one, or maybe it is changing the B leaf, but saying something like, for example, I have this thing, and I was trying to explain it to one of the guys at the event but um like that that link isn't just random or self-created it's like there's this third thing there's subject object and then there's a third thing that actually designates the link between those two things and that what's the third thing yeah some kind of godlike thing i guess this is where you kind of yeah so this is what i would describe as a justification for a contradiction between knowing they're not connected but feeling that they are you need an explanation so you come up with this idea of god yeah it is really interesting and especially god this is like getting into too much of a tangent but you think (laughs) about like language and how well like like how how words start to mean things aren't yeah yeah for sure i mean words this is exactly why we have these um the the brains that we have right because words don't actually mean anything they're just random noises yeah yeah but they come to evoke ideas and objects and all sorts of things because of the way we use them so our brains are very good at making that link between associative connection and actual connection and they could go a bit hyper on it and start yeah. doing with all sorts of things which is why you end up with these lists of correspondences that just look like dictionaries they just go on pages and pages mm. of all these co- things that correspond because because that and that is why we use this analogy all the time it's like oh this is like a this is like a language because it ends up being like a language it's like oh you know what i mean oh, that's so you know i do it with planets but like it, it could be anything like a rose we're all agreeing on this and they're not, not even universal symbols in the sense that there isn't a universal language, but pretty well I can navigate in my community with what we what roses signify for us. It's that's just, yeah, it's that's another way in which they're like language in that yeah. for you and I, because of the culture we're brought up in, roses mean love. But for another culture, it's probably a different flower that is yeah. given as a romantic gift. And so they wouldn't get that. That's, that's our language, our cultural language. I really like that guy who you ended up talking to. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, um, what do you call him leather baseball cap yeah leather, leather baseball cap, cap. that's yeah. <laughs> leather cap uh he looked like um uh he's a rich dog. evans i, I don't he's, know who that is he's a he's an internet um personality <laughs> if you know who he is you know who he is anyway so this guy's wearing a um track suit a gray tops and bottoms matching and uh sort of worn out trainers and a, a leather baseball cap it's i don't think i've ever cool seen cap. a leather baseball cap it's a brown leather baseball cap it was badass but yeah <laughs> somehow i ended up um chatting maybe a bit too long to him and <laughs> but um, he had questions about the correspondences he yes, had lots of questions yes. in fact i was really glad he was there this is why i said i really liked him because he asked all the awkward questions so i didn't yeah. have to ask them so he said do you literally think that the moon is connected to this list of things like are the correspondence literal or are they figurative 
Mm. And she said that they are connected through the years of people using them and the tradition. Um, yeah, exactly. So she was more on the side, clearly, of it's not literal. Yeah, definitely. He and he, he wanted it to be literal. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was really interesting. I, and then I was kind of trying to understand, like, what, like, what background, what is the underlying belief system for him that makes him really want to believe this is literal? Um, but we didn't really get that far. So, so but she did say, it was, this is the weird thing again, and it's just like people maybe are... Maybe one of the consequences of people in this in the neo pagan community not talking about their beliefs, beliefs very much is that their beliefs never become fully formed. Yeah. Because although she was saying this is all tradition and it's just um, it's kind of like an imaginative link, it's not a literal link. She did say things like, you know, there's more energy around at the time of the full moon. Yeah, it's like what? Yeah, yeah. Do you mean yeah. literally or figuratively? It's, honestly, this is one of my favorite things about doing this podcast. It's like you have made me question these things that I kind of found myself accidentally believing yeah um, it's a really really and just speaking firsthand like I feel like it's really good practice to to dig into this stuff and you might discover that you believe in things that you never thought you did believe but <laughs> isn't that strange how you can have beliefs that you're not aware of yes but I definitely noticed myself doing that for sure yeah, yeah. so then what was what was the next step where do we go on from there um oh that's right we cleansed our candles so she asked us all to pick the color the, of a spell the, candle like the best for our spell um so we're doing the same spell again um but this time we're choosing and how long are these do you think they're like 10 centimeters long um closer to 50 no i'm kidding yeah like 10 centimeters <laughs> long um it's, these spell candles i don't know why the idea to me seems really cool but it's something to do with how quickly they burn down yeah they're supposed to take like an hour and a half to burn max yeah so, so you're not a like a good amount of time day yeah because that was a big concern for a lot of people there's a lot of busy witches out there like i don't have time to burn my candle and it's considered i mean she said it's fine you can do it but i think it's generally considered a bit of a no-no to like do it in several stages right. yeah you're yeah, supposed yeah. to light the candle and then spend that time whilst the candle's lit not necessarily like focusing on it intently but you're supposed to be in the same room as it and like mm. engaging with its energy yeah yeah i love all this and we had to yeah do the same spell again but this time uh, we kind of have had some more tips, like how we, what the direction of how we wrote. Oh yeah. Well, it wasn't really a tip. It was like- You can do so, it any way you want. Yeah, do it any way you want. Some people do it from the top to the bottom. Some people do it from the bottom to the top. Some people do it from the top down to the middle and then from the bottom <laughs> up to the top. Some people do it round. Some people do it round clockwise. Like. <laughs> I've, these are all I've options lost, i've lost the will to live yeah i did it i did mine in like a spiral from the top to oh the bottom, nice you know. yeah so what color did you pick for your i chose green because that represents love to me even though she was like oh but a lot of people want to choose pink for love and i'm like no venus <laughs> it's a fact so yeah really seeing how um what would you call that like a uh, fundamentalist i am <laughs> with my <laughs> correspondence beliefs well, if they are just coming from your intuition, it's sometimes, I remember writing a essay, uh, this is a master's level essay when I was studying English literature, and it was referencing Jane Eyre, and I made some comment about how the, the fact that she was wearing green in a certain scene was an obvious reference to like the fae world. Oh. This is back, back in the day when I was much more into this sort of stuff. And I just wrote that sentence in amongst other sentences and didn't think about it. And um, my whatever the person marking the essay gave it back to me and said you need to back this up yeah um you need to put and i was like why do i need to back it up it's obvious green is linked <laughs> to the world of fairies everyone knows that and i think it actually is a common belief it's like a folklore belief in in the uk but i was studying in australia and they just thought i was mm. mad like what but the connection seems so obvious to me i didn't feel wow. the need to reference it yeah so yeah no, when, when they that. come like that to you of course you'll get fundamentalist about them yeah, yeah, this is a really interesting thing about correspondences, about those cultural differences. Like, I th always think red is a really funny one, because isn't it like, I want to say China, it just means something completely different. I think it's good luck in China. It's, yeah, right. Whereas for us, mm, maybe it's like, but it's, it's like war. Yeah, or, well, I was, my spell, thank you for asking, was, <laughs> was oh, for yeah. courage. You chose That's red. That's what I wanted, yeah. Um, so I was just like, you know, it's it's sometimes hard to be like, to be yourself because there's all these ideas about like 
you know you think people are judging you or whatever yeah. and especially talking publicly on the podcast and things I'm always thinking oh my god what are the skeptics thinking of me what are the seekers thinking of me it's like a whole thing in my head so I've generally been trying to be just more casual more myself mm. and to do that takes courage so yeah. I was like, courage is what I'm going for which is why I chose red nice and if you chose an animal it would be the or lion god damn it <laughs> you had to do it wrong um, yeah yeah no I boars are very brave <laughs> they've got those tusks I'm just thinking that because I'm drinking I have a mug with a boar on it right now right but yeah yeah your lion is obviously linked to courage um what would be linked to love what animal would be linked to love oh good question swan oh well, that's interesting because they pe- they mate for life and what? when they put their necks together it looks like a heart, heart. I was like rabbits because because they're having sex all the time <laughs> Well, that shows your conception. That's what you want from a soulmate, isn't it? It's really constant I'm, boning. I'm sure there's a game in this where you can be like, yeah, what animal do you associate with love? And it tells you um, about your psyche. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, and we had to cleanse the candles. Oh, we had an interesting chat with the other people at the table because she said, uh, so first she said, why don't you all talk about what color you're going to choose and why you chose it and like, you know, have a chit chat. Unfortunately, no one was talking about what spells they were casting. Oh no, I, I think really would have liked to know. But if anyone was having a green candle, like it's kind of obvious. Like there was one woman at the table who clearly had the same intention as me. But then there was another woman almost immediately before she even started speaking, before she even started the introduction, who put her hand up and said, Can we wish for money? Oh yeah, she was all about the money. It was weird. <laughs> it was really it was weird. weird. <laughs> other thing I noticed, completely off topic, but she and another woman had these insanely long fingernails. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a witchy a thing. Now. Come on, that's what witches have. I guess so, yeah. Like fake, long, ridiculous fingernails. Anyway, but yeah. for doing spells, it's not very convenient. Not very practical, yeah. Well, for life, it's not very convenient. I feel like it's uh, a bit so, um, dated. <laughs> so we all, Sorry. We all, <laughs> let's, let's judge. That's the other thing I was surprised at. I dressed up. I wore like a high neck black dress. Right. So I was like, well, I'm going to a candle <laughs> magic class. I'm going to look like a witch. Um, but no one else seemed to have. No, I was kind of doing the more like country. I was like the white witch. I think I was wearing white. You were wearing black. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we always take this so much more seriously? We take it so else? seriously, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, we had to cleanse the candle. That's the other thing we had to do. So we pick our candle. We talk about the different colors we're choosing. Some people were picking them based on um, the chakras. Someone said, you yeah. know, like each color is associated with a chakra. I can't remember what they, but they all had different systems that they yeah, were that using was cool. to pick them. Um, and then we held them all up to her little lantern that she'd drawn the circle with in the first place and said, may my clam- candle be cleansed with light. So um, I really like that. And it's actually something that I've, um, you know, spoiler alert, that's one of my takeaways from today. I've been doing this with, I tend to light a candle every day. And, you know, that's what I've been doing, holding up the so light you, to cleanse you've it. now cleanse them beforehand. I do, yeah. And the idea <laughs> basically is that candles pick up bad energy whatever that might mean uh from where they've been beforehand and so before you use them for any magic spell you don't want all that energy lingering around so you have to right. cleanse them I and this is just... very common isn't it in like new agey things people cleanse crystals and cleanse yeah things. that is an interesting because that whole idea of cleanliness um purity is a big like interesting psychological thing um i'm less interested in that i was more interested in like the intention that goes towards doing something like that it's just a bit more thoughtful it's it is like to me it's like saying grace before a meal it, it seems mm. like a nice thing to do with your candle anyway. it's interesting because she said she had a couple of tips on the cleansing you could cleanse them under moonlight um and uh, you could like put all your she said she puts all her candles out all her new candles out in a tray every full moon and, and some woman said oh this may be a silly question but do you have to turn them and she was like yeah you know what i do i turn them like sausages, like sausages. yeah that was a funny <laughs> moment these kind of really detailed questions usually really bug me. I'm just like, come on, like guys, just like she said the gist of it. You can, you can but, figure um, out the rest of it. That was that was well worth it because it was such a sweet image. Yeah, and but, she was very like she was slightly embarrassed, but also kind of proud of her weirdness. Yeah, it was very yeah. Sweet. I really like. And that you could tone. you could imagine her like setting a timer and getting up and turning them over so they like, yeah. get fully rotated. It's just like really practical. It's it's not like um... <laughs> yeah, practical. That's the word I'd use. <laughs> <laughs> um I, there's another word that i'm trying to think of utilitarian it's almost yeah. just like yep just got to get this done um oh she also said you always have to ca- cleanse candles that you buy from a shop yeah because other witches might be like getting their grubby intentions all over them 
exactly like imagine if someone's handled your candle you're you're trying to choose a candle to get a soulmate but someone else was trying to get a candle for a curse yeah and they were thinking about the curse they were going to do they pick up your candle and they're like no it's not the one for me put it back and then you pick it up oh yeah nightmare i get a cursed soulmate i never thought of that like but if you believe that all this energy is floating around and the other witches have powerful energies then actually an occult bookshop is going to be like a quagmire of other yeah. people's grubby energy just on everything like every single book is going to be covered in like other witch cooties yeah yeah completely so then we had a break i think didn't we we did we got to make some tea biscuits. this has been about an hour i think yeah and during this break it, i liked how she did this it was like a short break 10 15 minutes and in that time you had time enough to go to the toilet make some tea and sniff these different oils that we had on our tables so that we could choose one that felt most appropriate for our spell. And she was really encouraging us to choose that intu intuitively, like they weren't labeled. Yeah, they just had numbers on them. And she was like, I'll tell you what they are afterwards. Yeah, did you guess any of the smells? I guessed geranium because I use that. In, okay. Like I burn that at home because it smells super nice. And also I know what geranium smell like, but that's the only one I guess. I got rose, you? I got rose. Um, I didn't know, I thought that there was like a lemony one. I thought, oh, it's lemon, but it's like, no, it's not. Um, I chose Rose because it seemed appropriate to my spell. There you go. And um, it's funny because everyone's like, she specifically said, this is not a test. I'm not asking <laughs> you to guess what they are. I just want you to smell them and feel the one that's appropriate. Every single person was like, okay, can you guess? Let's write them yeah. down and see if we get them right. Like, it's, it's like, immediately it's a, became. It's not the point. That wasn't the game. <laughs> and then at the end, after the break, she, when she announced which one was which, there were people going, yes, I got it yeah, right. Yeah. She was like, no, that's Five not out the of point. Six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I chose um, Ylang Ylang, as I'm told Ylang, it's Ylang. pronounced, because uh, it smells kind of like sweat. <laughs> and I was like, you need so that weird. for courage, right? And I said to the man, I said to Leathercap, because he was at the same table, he gave it a whiff and he was like, oh, I don't like that very much. And I smelled it. I was like, oh, no, I don't like it either. I think it's the one for me. And he was like, what, are you doing a curse? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Child of Mars, like red <laughs> candle, sweaty um the smell i just love it um but you ended up talking to him a bit in the break didn't you to leather cap oh yeah that's when i was trying to understand what he believed and then i started talking about what i believed and explaining how i saw the difference between correlation and causation i don't think it you know maybe maybe it went in i don't think it did who am i to judge um but also then we had this thing of like he worked out because of the green candle and choosing rose he was like oh well, i know what you're wishing for and i was like oh fuck i'm digging myself <laughs> into a hole now and it turns out i probably was <laughs> oh no well no i'm just talking about at the end oh yeah well yeah. we'll get to that in a minute okay um, okay maybe he is your soulmate whilst you were <laughs> chatting up your soulmate i was talking to the teacher um i wanted to know because previously she had said that the magic doesn't come from the moon or from blue or from jupiter or whatever the magic comes from us mm. so i was like this is a really interesting theory i want to know exactly what she like what does she mean when she says it yeah. comes to us do we all have a reservoir of magic inside us that we're using up or like are we channeling it but then it's not coming from us we're just a channel like i wanted to know what her theory was behind all this so i asked her a sort of question to lead into that you said that you know magic comes from us do you think some mag people have more magic than others? Like, what's going on? And she was like, oh, no, no, no. I think she thought, she assumed that I thought I was an unmagical person. And she was like, Aww. trying to reassure me. She was like, no, it's like anything. It's like art. It's like playing a musical instrument. Some people have a natural aptitude for mm. it. Um, and some people need to practice more, but everyone has the ability. You just need to nurture the ability. And she said, um, you will, if you don't find that ma candle magic feels like it's working for you, you should just try other types of magic because it might be that one of those is the right one for you. Uh, for example, she said, I always felt a great attunement with weather magic. And I was like, weather magic? Yeah, what is that? Well, that's what I asked. And she said, oh, you know, it's magic to do with the weather. <laughs> Ah, yeah, she did. Uh, maybe she maybe she has a workshop on weather magic. She didn't want to give any weather magic info out for free. <laughs> I, I, I I just can't imagine being that person who doesn't so just weird, go into a full it? thing about like, well, let me tell you, <laughs> and like, <laughs> let me bore you for the next fifteen minutes. Because we'd already just done that. Like, you'd given a whole speech on um, astrology to our table when we were picking <laughs> the coloured candles, and as soon as the break came round, I something reminded me of Alistair Crowley, and I gave a big speech on that to all these poor. <laughs> people who come to learn about candle magic. And, and this is when you can tell it's like 
oh, I, I thought you were my people, but the looks on your faces right now and like the lack of response just shows that um, what, whatever we, the two of us have been doing on this podcast has, has, has uh, warped us somewhat, yeah. I think. <laughs> So I looked on her website for weather magic um, ah. to try and figure out what she was talking about. And I found one spell. I mean, I didn't look very deeply. Probably there's more. Uh, where you get a hagstone. Hagstones are stones with holes that go the whole way through them. And I've collected them since I was a witch. Uh, and I still collect them. I have loads and loads. I don't even know how many I have. Um, you get one of those. The reason they're magical, I think, is because it's thought to be a female symbol. Because it's like mm. a hole going through a thing. Uh, no explanation needed <laughs> yeah <laughs> you can work the rest out um and because Doreen Valiente who was like Gerald Gardner's number one high priestess a really big deal in the history of Wicca she collected them I went to an exhibition of her life once and they had her whole Hagstone collection she had loads and loads of them but I don't know anyway maybe they'd be they're just a weird thing and I really mm-hmm. like them because uh, you think about how they're formed so you have a stone and then a smaller stone sits on top of it and then the water gets in between the big stone and the little stone. And then it just sort of rolls around and slowly it makes a little dent. And then the dent uh-huh. gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it goes the whole way through. So that could take years and years, yeah. especially if it's a hard type of stone. That's why when we're on the beach, if you find a chalk one with a hole all the way through, I just throw it back. I think that's bullshit. Because chalk <laughs> is such a soft stone. That, that, that could happen in a week. I don't know. It could happen super fast. I'll make sure I never present you with a chalk <laughs> <Yeah>. stone. <laughs> I have seriously people, because everyone knows I collect these things because I've got so many of them. People have given me chalk ones. So I'll be like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm going to be throwing this back. Um, anyway, so the weather magic you could do with a hagstone uh, is to get a bit of wool or yellow string or what anything, but this was what she said or thread or whatever. And then you tie it through the middle and around the sides until the whole thing's covered with yellow oh, string yeah. or a significant portion is and whilst you're doing that you concentrate on sun hmm. and it actually looks really pretty it's like a lovely little craft project because it kind of becomes it looks like a sun with the rays going out from the center of the hagstone but um it's a good example of a spell because the whole point is you're doing this activity which is slightly crafty whilst you're focusing on a particular thing really yeah. really intently so that's the idea that those two things will connect and she believes and many witches believe literally change the weather oh yeah weird right and i like i wish i'd been able to have a conversation with her about it because after the thing where she was saying previously she said the correspondences are imaginative and magic is an uh, art um not a science and I really got the impression that she was from more of the perspective of like, this is something we do to focus our attention. It's kind of like a ritual for self-care. Mm. But if she believes you could tie a bit of string around a rock and that will make it sunny, that's a much more literal belief. Yeah. And I would have loved to explore that with her, but she wasn't giving me anything, unfortunately. Yeah, that whole, yeah. We'll, maybe we'll talk about this when we talk about um, the kind of ethics of magic. And just like, you know, why do people do certain spells? And that just feels like, even if you believed it, it just seems like a fucking silly thing to do. No offense to anyone who does weather magic. <laughs> no offense to all our weather witches out there. Please write in and tell us your your successes. Because I I remember when um back when I was a witch, uh, the high priestess my sorry the high priest of my coven, he used to have this thing where often when he would call a circle, it would start to rain, and he quite, kind of got the things connected in his head and believed that somehow he was summoning storms. It's not an uncommon belief because obviously we have very changeable weather mm. and you connect those two things in your head and every time that doesn't rain when you cast a circle, you forget that time. Confirmation think, bias, you know. Yeah, I think the problem I have with it is you're doing a spell that isn't just affecting you. It's like if, 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 that, if that was to work, it would affect everyone around you. Yeah. Like that just seems a bit... Anyway. And it's like messing with the weather system. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's... It's, Anyway, yeah, you're right. You get into that. You could do some research on the ethics of magic and we'll talk about it later. Um, So we come back from the break and it's time to anoint our candles with the oil that we've chosen. Yeah, this is good. Um, And she had little paintbrushes ready for us to like dip in and um, paint our candles, basically. Yeah, it's just, again, she gave us lots of tips, just like carving the word into the candle. Uh, Anointing is the same. You can do it from bottom to top, from Mm. top to bottom, from the top to the middle and then from the uh, bottom to the middle you could, you could dapple them on just like little yeah <laughs> so cool. many options um you could do it with your finger you could do it with the paintbrush you could do it with a 
I don't know, anything you like. But in this class, we're doing it with paintbrushes. It did and she was quite strict nice. about that because she didn't want to get the um, oils all mixed up, which is very sensible. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I like this idea of the anointing of the candles. Um, it would suck if you get a container one because I guess you can't really do it. Like I just bought a fat Yankee candle the other day. and um, You can still do it around the top. Like, oh, sure, just paint on the yeah. top of it. Thank you, good tip. <laughs> Again, it's just another thing. If you think of this as a ritual that is supposed to calm you down and help you focus on what you want, then another little action, especially with a, um, a sensory component mm. of smelling the smell, yeah. that is a really lovely thing to do. Yeah, it really is. It is combining, I guess, all of the senses, this whole thing. Oh, mm, okay. that's what, like you'll notice this with magic in general it's very essential and um deliberately so they will try you you're saying beautiful words you're smelling beautiful smells you're um often you're you've got like the light is down and the candles are on so you're and you you feast afterwards differently yes yeah she kept talking or about that and i was like she's fun i want to do some like have some magic evenings with her where we all have a feast afterwards feasting is a huge part of wicca That's it's cool. the, one of the best things about wicca um so there's a kind of communion that witches often will do which is uh, like the wine and the bread mm. um in fact we've done it at a couple of events haven't we when we've been hanging out with those sort of people and they'll pass a chalice around oh, yeah. with wine in or grape juice or whatever and then they'll pass bread around but often at least i think this is common this is what my cousin used to do back in the day after you finish after you closed up the circle and finished for the evening it's time to get out a huge picnic and That's there's so just nice. booze and weed and delicious food and it's like the best time ever there's like some of the happiest days of my youth having big picnics with loads of mates after we just worked some magic yeah nice yeah i, I honestly feel like that's missing I, I, I if i'd go back to my youth now i'd be like i wish there was some magic in it yeah just yeah, making up I, for I, it now <laughs> So what, did, oh, she started talking about the other candle spells that we could yeah, potentially do. Yeah, this was cool. Again, I just loved all this sort of symbolism. Like they're so clever. So there was the banishing and summoning spell with a black candle and a white candle. Yeah, so the idea is um, you think about when you've got the black one, you think about all the things you want to get out of your life. Um, and the white one is all the things you want to get into your life. And you light them thinking about those things and keep them burning for however long yeah um go on. what was next um there was oh the moving candle spell yes so th this one you told me about before oh really yeah you told me about i think i don't know if it's like a missing cat or like something that you wanted to find and oh you, i have done i have worked magic like this before <laughs> yeah. and it was it you light the candle and but i swear with with one that you told me there was something to do with a piece of string oh no you're thinking yeah it's a very similar spell again spells are so intuitive so the spell that i told you about and i think this was on the podcast maybe i can't remember yeah. what episode is where you write down what you want and, and you put it on a little piece of paper and you fold it up and then you tie a bit of string around it and you throw it to the other side of the table and then That's slowly it. draw it towards you whilst mm -hmm. focusing on it coming to you yeah this is the same sort of um theory it's you you've got a spell that represents you and a spell that represents the thing you want and then you just bring them closer over a period of time. And it could be like months, like you just edge them a centimeter closer on your shelf until they're together. Yeah. yeah. And, and you like, could do it the opposite way, obviously, if it's something you want to get rid of. Right. And um, the witch's bottle. I actually blanked out for this one. I, I was getting like overloaded with candle magic. <laughs> it's interesting so witch's bottle is one of the most traditional spells um that like cunning folk this is I, I who knows what they called them but back in the day um cunning folk would have worked this type of magic um the idea is that they're like decoys uh so if someone's sending you bad energy or bad magic or whatever you want it to go to the bottle instead of to you oh so, yeah this is why she said, and this is, this is traditional, you put your urine in it because then the spell, like the magic will be like, oh, that must be the person that's full of that urine and just go straight to it. Because that's what people are, oh, what do they say? People are 90% urine, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure to the and then, and then you put in um, needles. Yeah. And this is and really funny. She was like, this is to cause cystitis. Right. I was like, oh, that's so mean. What the hell? I never heard that before. Um, specifically cystitis. That explains but yeah, it's basically... why I've got all that cystitis. People don't spell <laughs> it's to deter, to deter the bad energies, basically. Um, I remember there's, you know, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. Yes. They have witches bottles there. And one of them actually has a witch in it. 
Oh, wow. It's like a little, I've got the description. I, I found it on their website. Um, it's a, it's, so this is like the little, uh, it's, so it's like a little glass bottle, um, only like 10 centimeters long, kind of uh, rounded. Uh, the description on the card next to it says, a small ribbed glass bottle, silvered inside, a figure eight form, is corked and sealed up with brown wax. The old lady living in a village near Hove, Sussex, which is right near us, by whom it was obtained about 1915, remarked, they do say there'll be a witch in it, and if you let them out, there'll be a peck of trouble. Oh, wow. That's cool. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that whole idea of like genies in the lamp. Yes, completely. And the, the idea that you could capture a, a bad spirit, or a good spirit, I guess, yeah. in a in a receptacle like that this was donated to the museum i found out by margaret murray herself who wrote the witch cult in western europe and is basically like the grandmother of wicca which is pretty cool but not a particularly reliable source <laughs> so <laughs> i remember when i was living in oxford the, the reason why this came back into my head there were some local wiccans who were like trying to get the witch released <laughs> which well, was amazing but apparently they're not successful because it's still on their website it's still listed as a, an artifact that they have <laughs> but yeah, the idea of putting, there's a classic kind of spell, either you put all the, and this is the other example of the witch's bottle she showed, she showed a champagne bottle that she'd had for her birthday, mm. and she'd enjoyed the champagne with all her friends, and then she like, uh, what's that called, decoupage? Yeah, Where yeah. you glue stuff on? Yeah, so she glued all sorts of happy, like, birthday cards and happy memories to the outside of it, and she was like, oh, you could put like, you could get everyone to write you well wishes on a piece mm. of paper and then put that inside and you could put rose petals inside and you could put we put whatever you want inside yeah. anything you could fit in a bottle and then jam a candle on top of it and there you go i really like that idea really nice it is a really nice idea yeah and then it's just sitting on your side and every time you look over it you're like oh remember that lovely time yeah yeah well, i'm gonna do that at some point um and and then did we kind of wrap up yeah, so she we did the grounding. Yeah, um, this is nice. So she got out some popcorn, salted popcorn, because she was saying how salt, which I knew from ayahuasca stuff, like salt is the way you kind of close a dieta. Oh, really? Um, yeah, it's it does kind of, I don't know, yeah, I guess it's that grounding quality. It's like, just kind of tells the magic to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the idea is something like um, to bring you back into the, because... And I think she said this when she drew the circle, the whole point of creating a circle is to create a liminal space between this world and the other world, the world of yeah. physical mundane stuff and the world of magic. So if you've been hanging out in the world of magic for a bit, you might be a bit like spacey, but yeah. eating something will bring you back to earth. I That's remember it. going to a Kundalini yoga class once and it had like big, beautiful glass um, wall and door. And we got up after the class and someone was in a hurry to get out. She just ran like walked straight into the door yeah naturally. she was just like because she was in that like she was all relaxed and you know befuddled and i think that's like that's a genuine thing that happens to, well, i don't think it happens because of any mysterious energy yeah, i, th it's just I think like, if you've been in a deep meditation the same thing can happen yeah. um but yeah it was funny because uh you know this was at the time recording this at the time of the coronavirus and yeah i don't know it's it's definitely getting big uh and a lot of people didn't take popcorn i was one of them yeah I did, did because I felt so bad that no one yeah. was taking it and she knew like, this ever but it was also kind of awkward because it was like and like I how do you get like one like a couple of pieces of popcorn out of a Tupperware of popcorn without touching them all yeah exactly it's and I don't want to touch the dumbest all food to bring at a time like this really, but obviously really that weird. was that was part of her thing and like it it would have been really sweet and great it had the timing been a bit better but yeah um so then she talked about the ethics of magic but she hardly said anything it no was like it was an one of the really good points is like for example you want a soulmate don't name anyone in particular because <laughs> that's mean like don't um try to bring a particular person to you because that's unethical that's going against their will potentially yeah um, so she basically said spells that concern other people are like ethically yeah, dodgy right but she yeah, told a even story if you're doing something nice i think yeah she told a story of how they had like once she was working somewhere and they had a horrible boss and they wanted to like wish for him to get fired <laughs> or to go away but they thought that's that's not very nice so we'll wish for him to get a better job somewhere else yeah which he did yeah a month later so that was pretty yeah cool. um yeah and then I, you said how on how oh my god how do i reverse a spell what if yeah I just it's like made shit. the biggest mistake of my life yeah and apparently there are ways of doing that so you can use black candles yeah black for banishing yeah um 
Can you remember any? You could use. Else? You could buy a reversal candle. Oh where yeah. It's like one color on the inside and the yes. other color on the outside. Um, that's. I mean, that's an amazing that someone is making that product and selling it for witches. <laughs> I think is impressive. That's that's a truly entrepreneurial spirit going on there. <laughs> maybe a literal spirit. Um, <laughs> I don't know, like, I guess maybe you'd have to get the colour that you use for the first candle. Yeah, I don't know which way around it goes. I guess there'll probably be details about that online as well. Yes, I'm sure. Uh, um, and what was the other thing? Cutting ties? Yeah, so you just sort of imagine, um, like, you visualise, you light your candle, and whilst you're lighting your candle, you imagine all your connection to the original wish disappearing. Sure. It's just another visualisation type thing. Yeah, Yeah, that was all good to know. And then... And then she talked about her magical flame, the flame yeah, of Yeah, then we found out what this whole lantern thing that she'd been waving around all evening was about. Yeah, so, you know, she kind of did a little bit of chat about sacred flames in general and mentioned the Vestal flame back in ancient Greece. Greece or Rome? Rome? Rome. Greece? Rome. I don't know. I thought you knew about this. You were telling me about the virgins. Vestal. Oh, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but anyway, Grome. They had, um, <laughs> they had to keep this, this flame alive, uh, this sacred flame that was something to do with the goddess Vesta. <laughs> Did do my research on this one. She sounded like an expert that evening. I was like, she was like, oh, well, the Vestal flame, I love the Vestal flame. It's well, got to be kept alive I just remember virgins. this bit that there are these like Vestal virgins whose job it is, I think from the time they're very young, to like not marry. I think, yeah, this is by the time it was in Rome. So it went from being this lovely thing about a goddess to this kind of like strange thing where if the girls um, were caught not being <laughs> virginal, <laughs> um, they were buried alive. That's, yeah, that's pretty dark. Um, Bridget's flame, Bridget flame. Do you know so anything about that? So this is the Irish <laughs> goddess, yeah, yes. who s- sort of became, um, what's that word they use, syncretized, I think is yes. the word? Yeah, yeah, into yeah. The, into the St. Bridget. Uh, we talked about her in the Glastonbury episode because we went to her mound, didn't we? I don't remember that at all. We we went up on a mound with John, remember? He took Something us up like there. That. We meditated. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there was some sacred flame related to her. I don't know exactly the details. It was yeah. low on details. I think generally this yeah, workshop was low it, on details. I mean, she covered a lot of territory, low on details. That's exactly how I like it. So, um, <laughs> And then she was talking about modern sacred flames. And yeah, how- and this was... This, harked back to Glastonbury as well yeah the because, Glastonbury goddess temple yeah this is where this flame that she um had been using the whole evening came from uh she said it was like on the the last day of the Glastonbury goddess f- festival in like 2009 or something and they had all these people from all over with all their sacred flames like they had some kind of international woman's flame and a flame of peace and all these flames that were famous flames <laughs> and they all came together and they lit one candle and that became the goddess glastonbury goddess temple's flame and then everyone who was there lit their own candle from that candle and took them home and it's become like a thing yeah i thought that was pretty cool and it's um, sweet and then we all I got, I got so excited we all got to get a little birthday candle like a birthday cake candle and light it from the goddess flame sorry the flame of avalon uh, yeah. and it's avalon because that's the thought to be the ancient name for glastonbury basically or yeah what is now King Arthur and all that stuff um and we can now go home and we could do our our we could basically do our spell again using our spell candle the one that we've anointed light it with our special avalon flame and yeah the problem is it's um i haven't done mine yet no, I haven't done mine either. And I want to wait to the next full moon, so it's going to be a while before. Um... <laughs> um, I don't know about this. So, I mean, I don't know about any of this, but <laughs> on this specific point, I feel like so. This is a tradition that I've had for many years. On the winter solstice, I will try, and I usually manage it, and I definitely manage it from now on, because I now have a decent lantern to do it with. I try to see the sunset and light a candle and then keep that candle going all night on the longest night and then blow it out at the sunrise the next day. And this has always been a real pain in the ass because it's like, I like to go somewhere nice to see the sunset, obviously. So I like, I'll walk up a hill, but then you're trying to light a candle at the top of a hill. And I've tried putting them in jars and I've tried all sorts of things. But this year for Yule, my husband got me a beautiful, like old fashioned kerosene lantern. 
Cool. So now I can light that, and that will definitely stay at light all night, and it's much easier because it's like a storm lantern, so it works nice. perfectly. And also, it's just a pretty object. Yeah. But to me, and again, this is just one of these intuitive things that seems very important to me, but I cannot justify it at all. It's really important that it's the same flame. Like putting it out and then lighting it again is not the same thing. As far as I'm concerned, if it's gone out, it's out. You may as well give up. That really sums up your belief system. <laughs> In yeah, the big, does, like it? there is nothing symbolic <laughs> about this it's just like no it has to literally be that flame so yeah, interesting so but i the, do see it I, I i feel a bit niggly about this as well a bit like especially that tea light one which we blew out and would then light again i was like fuck that like this the magic is done we can't yeah. just light that again when we get home like no i feel like the reason why it feels psychologically powerful is because at some part of your brain you're entertaining the idea that's literally true. And yeah. by doing these things like, oh, you, you know, you can just light your birthday candle and then uh, put that out and then light it again at home and it will be the same flame. Like that destroy like any literal belief in it is annihilated. Yeah, and I think there's a sort of like natural respect, reverence that we have to these um, beliefs, even if we're sort of playing with them and we think that it's their real not in the same way that this table is real they're like real in a different way we still want to respect that as if it was real it's it's yeah. like how seriously are you playing this game and um yeah i'm trying to think because i had these moments playing with my sisters growing up and i can't remember which of us i want to say it's my middle sister um who would get quite upset with things being non like literal it's like no mm. that's a dog it wouldn't be wearing clothes or like you know, if we're going to make them talk, well, we have to use Barbies. We can't use the cuddly toys. Yeah. You know, like that kind of mentality. Whereas I think I'm, I've always been pretty happy with, ah, uh, good enough. It's all made up anyway. Who cares? Yeah. 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 I don't know. It, it's really weird. Yeah. One of the women asked, one of the women with the long fingernails asked, how are we going to keep this alight on the train oh, on the geez. way home? I, I think like, I actually audibly sighed because I was like... <laughs> And she was like, oh, you silly lady, you don't need to keep it alight. And I actually thought that was a legit question because I think, not. but then I, I, went, I went to the Glastonbury Goddess Temple website to find out about this flame and that isn't even kept alight all the time. Oh no. But they light it once a month. Yeah, that's lame. I'm like, well, this yeah. is not, a, we're talking about sacred flames, we're talking about the Vestal flame and Bridget right. flame. They These were pretty dedicated to things. keeping yeah. those. Hmm. You can't just half ass it. <laughs> That is um, your take on magic. One day, I think we should do a magic workshop. I think it would be the funniest thing ever. I was thinking that so much on the way home. I was like, we could actually do a really good one, which we wouldn't have to like pretend. No, it would I be... could talk about the psychology. Yes. Um, you could do the slightly more wooey stuff, yes. but we could still make it a really like enriching experience. Definitely. Oh, um, maybe we should do yeah. that. Okay, so we probably shouldn't talk about this whilst we're recording, but maybe <laughs> that would be a good Patreon reward it would like, be lovely we could do like we could film it and have it all like make it all nice and let dress up all witchy and put all our candles out and all our bits and bobs well listeners let us know if you would be up for this um yeah if you'd appreciate a candle magic workshop from a seeker and a skeptic yeah. maybe we could sort it out for you hassle us on social media at seeker skeptic <laughs> etc uh, so that was it really wasn't it and then it was it was time to go home but not before you had one last uh conversation with leather cap i had an encounter i mean as we were <laughs> the the treadwells actually stayed open for us like you know a few minutes after the workshop and we were browsing some books i was i really wanted to buy something didn't really know what unfortunately leather cap kind of started to awkwardly talk to me um but it wasn't really a proper conversation it was like how can i hover long enough to maybe say something and how and my my question was how can I exit this situation as with Do you think possible? he was working up the courage to ask for your number or something? Possibly. Yeah, I got I definitely got that. I should have been. Well, that would have been embarrassing I just really can I could see it happening. Head. I could see that you were being monopolized by him and I knew that you didn't really want to be in the conversation. Well, because it wasn't but a conversation. Was, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, or I could just stand here and look at these books and not say her. You were not entirely helpful, I will say. Yeah, that. sorry about that. But, I'm um... I'm a terrible wing person. <laughs> the opposite i needed an anti-wing person yeah. i needed a banishing person <laughs> oh but you said you could have just got a black candle out of your pocket and <laughs> stared at him and lit it it would have been amazing so mean so oh mean. no he seemed nice but yeah. very strange he seemed yeah. very like um 
uh, of the kind of Crowley persuasion. Yes, yes, my like, God. Very into the kind of occult stuff. Yeah, yeah. He, so you he didn't actually... be a great Crowley person. <laughs> so you didn't actually, he didn't ask for your number. I guess you no. managed to give out enough no vibes. Definitely. I was giving off the no vibes quite powerfully at the end, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, yeah, and uh, and he he left um and then we waited for a little while so we didn't right. have to walk along the street with i just him. i can't help but think my my spell just worked extra quickly and yet i didn't specify it closely enough like yeah he probably was my soulmate but um oh, leather cap if you're out there <laughs> tweet us no he's he's he seemed like a nice enough guy but i, I don't i wouldn't have him pegged as your soulmate yeah fair enough I'll, I'll for one looking. thing he seemed to be quite into god yeah i mean that's that's fine um if you're listening out there that's fine um <laughs> but that's what i was trying to get to grips on when we we're talking about beliefs i was like so so what how is this all tying in for you like honestly like genuinely interested like what do you believe Didn't get so you you haven't done your spell yet um i haven't done my spell yet but what do you overall like think of the class would you recommend i it? loved it yeah i and i really recommend the teacher i thought she was just the right level of um you know she's taking it seriously but has that soft edge to her which says this is also let's make this fun um mm. and yeah i thought there's lots of information in there like way more than i expected i kind of just thought we'd all be sitting in a circle and doing like a spell and it would be a bit creepy but it wasn't it was like really educational it's so funny because i wouldn't recommend it because you've reminded me it cost 30 pounds, which I'd forgotten, <laughs> but also because it wasn't creepy enough. I really <laughs> want the creepy vibes. If I'm going to a candle magic class, that's why I dressed up. You know, I want to be sitting on the ground. I want, so what I want is like a big blackboard. And then I want her to draw <laughs> these creepy symbols. That I don't understand. <laughs> like, I think this is why I like Thelema so much. It's got more <laughs> of that, like aesthetic. This was just so safe and sweet. Um, and also it was a bit 101 from my perspective because Oh I, my god. And just r listeners, as a reminder, Rebecca is the skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I used to be a witch. I know how to cast a fucking spell. How hard is it? You just <laughs> you choose your things, right? All spells work the same way. You choose things that remind you of things. You do like a little meditation. You say some words that are kind of poignant. And that's you're spell. giving away all of our workshops. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> but it's like once you learn the basic, it's like cooking, right? Yeah. So once you learn the basic ingredients for spellcraft, you can make your own very, very easily. Right. And that's something I learned to do when I was a teenager. So this was all like, but I guess, yeah, I was thinking this is what I want, but someone has never done that before. Obviously, it's not. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I think, I think future ones that she might do maybe she if she did a course that would be great because you could get more creative but for, for yeah. complete beginners this is pretty good <laughs> great so i guess we will um we'll be back after the break to talk a bit more about our research that Indeed. we've done on magic and all the, all the different sort of avenues that we opened up in the candle magic class i i just wanted to ask you rebecca um did your spell come true Oh my! I I didn't I didn't burn my candle. Yeah, I haven't burnt mine either. I'm saving it for a, a juicy full moon. Oh uh, yeah. Um, I have seen it a couple of times sitting there and thought about burning it, but feels too precious. I'm like I have to <laughs> save it for a big occasion. I'm kind of having the opposite perspective. Like I feel like it's kind of silly. Like it, if I don't know. Well, it was a birthday candle with the magic one, right? And we yeah. To, uh, it, why was it a birthday candle? But you know I, what I did do? I um I, after we talked about weather magic, mm -hmm. I got out one of my big hex, hag stones, oh, yeah. and I wrapped it up um with uh, twine, yellow twine. Um, it looks really pretty actually. Put it on my windowsill, and I thought to myself, clearly this is just for a bit of fun, and because we've been talking about it, and because I wanted to send you a picture of it as a joke. Um, oh, my hag stone is massive. For, like oh, maybe I'll put a photo on Instagram, but it's huge. It's like I don't know how. Like what size ball is that? Large. So no, like a like a basketball, like a basketball, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know sports. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Be large ball. stone with a hole through the middle, and I I put my twine through it. And whilst I was putting the twine through it, I did try and focus on um, sunny thoughts, like the woman had said. And then I thought, 
why did I spend my time doing this? And I, I put it on the windowsill and I thought, well, every time I look at it, I'll just think of sunshiny thoughts. Uh, and I'll think, why happen. isn't it sunny? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a waste of time. It's a lovely piece of de home decor and it will cheer me up and make me think of sunshine when I look at it. And then like for the next week, it was just it's beautiful true. and sunny. <laughs> it's true. I did. I remember texting you and being like, you witch. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thanks, Rebecca, for the nice weather. Appreciate yeah. it. Again, great example of uh, confirmation bias, right? <laughs> great example of magic. So let's <laughs> talk about the history of magic, if you don't mind. Yeah, I really went into a bit of a deep dive on this one. So feel free to tell me to speed up if I'm belaboring any points. Get your tea, <laughs> listeners. Uh, so I started with the um our brains right <laughs> and how we evolved to be human beings and the, <laughs> the <laughs> so stop the history. <laughs> yeah. maybe get two cups of tea everyone um <laughs> so we've already talked about confirmation bias confirmation bias is a, a you know it crops up almost every show um and it's something that we evolved just basically um i think even perhaps it's a pre-human thing it's just the way our brains work so i won't go on about that but there are two other really important things to understand why we believe in magic as human beings um one of them is apophenia or uh, sometimes it's called patternicity uh, which is basically um we see patterns when there are none there so our brains are like overactive pattern recognition devices we're just we see everything in the world and we want to draw connections between them and this is a really obvious um, reason why we function like this because the human who spots a pattern that isn't there usually gets on fine but the human who doesn't spot a pattern that is there so the example the classic example that's always given is if you hear a rustle in the rustle a rustle a rustle in the bushes then it's safer to assume that that is a tiger coming for you um, than to assume that it's not so the person who makes the connection and goes oh rustle that might be a tiger and runs if there's no tiger there that doesn't cost him anything really mm. but if he makes the opposite mistake and doesn't or just goes oh it'll be fine then maybe it will be fine but maybe he'll get eaten by the tiger so that you could just see how we were selected for the people who make connections and that's why we are that way the other thing that sort of flows into this is we are very suspicious of contagion like mm. way over suspicious of contagion and they've done all sorts of interesting experiments where they like like they ask people to drink water out of a potty just a clean plastic potty that's never been used for children to toilet in. Uh, but just the fact that in our mind it's connected with feces, like, no, not doing mm. that. The other classic example is what's called the serial killer's jumper. I think I read about this in a Bruce Hood book. And if you're interested in the way our brains work, I would recommend Googling Bruce Hood and reading a couple of his books. But anyway, so what he's talking about is you get a bunch of students and you say, I've got this psychological experiment. Who will try on this cardigan? And they're like, oh, you know, a couple of hands go up. People are quite happy to do it. He says, before you put it on, I should let you know it did used to belong to Ed Gein or some famous serial killer. And people don't want to put it on. Why? because imaginatively it's linked with a serial killer. And mm. even that imaginative link, it feels like the thing itself is contaminated. The sort of positive opposite side of that is when you go to, like I've been to a museum and I've seen um, Darwin's original samples with his handwriting on the labels. And it's just like, oh, wow. Why? Because it's connected to him. It's like a, yeah. so we're really, so those two, those three things, confirmation bias, apophenia, and the suspicion of contagion, basically means we're predisposed to believe in something and I think it was James Fraser who came up with this term called sympathetic magic which is basically the idea that we can affect things in the world by getting something that reminds us of the mm. thing and then manipulating it so the classic example would be poppets or voodoo dolls um, you get something that looks like the person that you're trying to affect and then you do things to it mm -hmm. uh and so we first we've got the apophenia so you connect the pattern between the real world and the symbolic world then you have the suspicion of contagion which is how you make your doll you put the thing that reminds you of it or in the case of our candle magic class we literally write it on um and then you have the confirmation bias so you do all mm -hmm. those steps and when it works you remember it and when you don't it forgets and those three 
biases or predispositions or whatever you want to think of set up like the whole of the history of magic right and they're all biologically useful things to have Basically. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we would be screwed without them. We really yeah. would. And uh, like our whole civilization and culture is based on the fact that the fact that we can make patterns and the, f- the fact that we can, we're sensitive to potential contagion. All yeah. these things are really, really important. We've so I'm not saying we should get rid of them. When we're not sensitive to contagion, uh, yeah. things can kind of go awry. Exactly. <laughs> so this is exactly why you see even in very early societies, examples of what anthropologists think are magical thinking and magical behavior. Um, The earliest ones are what they call hunting magic. So I love, I love reading about early man. I don't know why I've always been fascinated with this. I love going to see any kind of artifacts or cave paintings or anything. And um, one of the popular theories about cave paintings, because this is, so there's this weird thing, right? There are cave paintings in strange places, like places where it would be hard for other people to see them. Um, and there's all sorts of odd things about cave paintings that suggest they aren't simply art. But that is the, th- the first theory, obviously, that comes to people's mind. Cave paintings, they're the earliest form of art. And that's certainly a plausible theory. Maybe it's the most plausible theory. I don't know. But there are a couple of other theories. One is that they are ritual acts, which would explain why some are drawn in places why no one can see them, because the seeing the drawing isn't important it was the act of drawing it that was important Um, another idea is that it's shamans um, or people playing that role in the society painting things they saw in visions which would explain why you sometimes see strange things like half human half animal creatures things like that and then another theory which is closest to the sort of sympathetic magic thing is that it's a form of hunting magic Uh, so you would be like oh i want to catch an antelope to eat tomorrow so i'm going to draw a picture of him tonight and then that will sort of summon him in to the world so that we can hunt him down. So like, as I mean, one of the reasons why all these ancient things are so fascinating is because we don't really know. Um, but it seems possible that there was some sort of magical thing going on there. And if you look at um, hunter-gatherer societies that live more like our ancestors did, you do see, you know, you see shaman, shamanistic practices and you see things that look like hunting magic. So it's not it's not a bonkers idea to think that that could be our earliest example of magic. Mm-hmm. But scrolling forward, <laughs> scrolling down my documents, <laughs> I will take you to uh, ancient Egypt. That's where we're next going to pick up. Um, so in ancient Egypt, they called magic Heka. Um, and like Heka thing? No. Oh. Common mistake. <laughs> ah, yeah, when I was Googling it, because that's exactly what I thought straight away. I was like, what's the link? No link, unfortunately, because <laughs> that would be cool. Hecate, as you all know, listeners, is a Greek goddess. Uh, was she Greek or Roman or both? Um, and she's also, she's a triple goddess, isn't she? Sure. She's a good one to look out, out for. Anyway, interestingly, um, oh, I'll get on to Greek magic in a minute. So... <laughs> <laughs> In ancient Greece, the, they, so this is all from um, interpretations of hier- hieroglyphics. So we actually have this documented so we can be a bit more certain about what they're up to than we can be about cavemen, obviously. Uh, so they believed that um, Heka was one of the forces used to create the world. It's like a generative force. And also the god, a god called Heka. So it's like it means two things at once. It means magic, but it also means the god of magic. Um, magic and medicine and those two things are often intertwined Um, so from the coffin texts which are dated they were written on coffins that's why they're called the coffin texts Uh, uh, 2181 to 2055 BC Hecker claims like this this is Hecker the god speaking so they say I think it's a he but let's just say they to me belong the universe before you gods came into being. You have come afterwards because I am Heka. Pretty nice. cool god. Um, so yeah, also you'll be happy to learn. Apparently they thought redheads had more of it. More Heka. Of course. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> I just found one reference to this in my long trawl through the internet. Um, and I couldn't find anything to back it up. But I thought it was worth mentioning. <laughs> well, my mum used to tell me that like, her mum would tell her that red-headed women were witches oh really mm. i think it's just because it's an unusual thing isn't it? anything unusual people would be like i mean it's unusual but it's common enough that you would know yeah. someone with red hair um no it's probably just because you're actually magic that's why 
<laughs> but every everyone has hacker but um some people have more than others and uh, there are rules that were encoded about how it could be used basically it was mainly used for protection uh for healing and that's where it crosses over uh, medicine and for curses. So protection against curses and doing curses. Seems like if you just stop both of those, you'd be fine as a culture. Um, and then the healing. And they had um, specific priests who would specialize in that and you would go to their temple to be healed. And they would use a mixture of, you know, whatever they, the best they had as far as medicine went and also ritual stuff at the same time. Very cool. Completely I'd molded in their mind. Yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? There's a, in, you've heard of the Book of the Dead, though, the Egyptian yeah. Book of the Dead. So that has 190 spells in it. That's how they thought oh. of it. Um, they're kind of like um, instructions to help the soul reach the, the, what they call mm. the field of reeds, which is like their afterlife. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a big part of their society, basically, a big part of their culture. Um, and there's so much to read about it. Um, and I probably will immediately after we finish recording. <laughs> Uh, ancient Greek magic, not quite so interesting. This is one of these um, situations where uh, magic is just like a derogatory term for an un inappropriate religion, religion that isn't the religion of the, the dominant populace. Uh, this also becomes like a synonym, synonym for someone who is trying to rip people off. And there are a lot of those people around at that time. Um, I can't remember exactly the details, but there was this thing they used to do where they would like uh, get an egg and then they would like palm a snake like have a snake up their sleeve and like crack it open the snake would come out and they'd say oh this means you're going to die unless you give me money for a cursed protection amulet or stuff like they had all sorts of scams going on back then I mean I'm sure they I'm did really in surprised. ancient Egypt too but I'm really? surprised that it's gone back well uh, for some reason I thought that they would be quite a magical people I mean yeah I think it's years. really difficult to say because like again, this is the problem with the definition of magic it may well be that they were doing things that we might think of as magic but because it was part of their religion they didn't think mm. of it as magic so yeah but yeah um so christians picked up that theme basically accusing any religious practice of being magic that wasn't theirs and they used that excuse to persecute people and that's you know that's the history of the world basically <laughs> thanks christians <laughs> um there's i mean i'm sure yeah it's not just them but they have been kind of famous for it then i'm going to take you from ancient greece i'm going to zip on forward to europe like late medieval early modern period i think that's around like 1500 a.d sorry if i'm giving you whiplash guys <laughs> but here we have all over europe these people called cunning folk and this is where a lot of our ideas about witches come from. So, you know, that's kind of vision of like, like, what's your typical witch? Can you describe where she lives and, you know, what she looks like? Well, she's kind of haggard. I mean, mm -hmm. I've literally got um, like a fairy tale witch in my head. You know, she has yeah. like a wart on her nose and she's wearing a pointy hat with the wide brim. She's wearing a black cape. She has a black hat and she has a broom. That's yeah. And she lives likely to. in the edge of the village or maybe in the forest or in a boot. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, wasn't there a fairy tale? <laughs> wasn't that um all Mother Hubbard? I get Hubbard and witches confused. <laughs> yeah, it's an easy, <laughs> easy confusion to make. So that idea, that like old lady, spooky hedge, herbal potions, all that sort of thing, that is kind of what cunning folk were, but um they're actually two thirds male. So the oh. the sex is different um than our conception but yeah it's these people who are like on the edge of society who people are kind of intimidated by but also go to for help with things that they can't get help for elsewhere um and they were all they were so different like some of them did have um familiars what we think of as familiars today um or weird pets um that they were very attached to some of them didn't uh some of them wore weird clothes and it was like a um it was a profession mm. so it was in their interest to sort of play the role a bit and to look a bit strange because people would think oh well you must be really good at your job then if you're wearing that weird hat and, and what kind of work would they do do they use like i imagine them being like which um like herbal doctors of, of yeah kind. exactly like yeah a lot of herbalism um a lot of uh amulets uh 
a lot of i mean it's the actually it's the same thing that they were yeah. doing in ancient egypt basically it's protection charms um curses and well you know you didn't want to do too many curses because that would get you a bad reputation but um and then medicine stuff things that and people who didn't have access to medicine or you know there literally weren't cures invented yet would have gone to them for help with stuff and do you think there was like a like um an apprentice kind of program <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's interesting to look at how they got into their jobs a lot of them it's hereditary so they would mm -hmm. have had a weird old aunt who was in the biz and then mm -hmm. they get onto it but a lot of them seem to have just like decided to do it by themselves it's they are more likely to be literate than the general population wow. so they would i mean that that's impressive to uh, um, someone in that period to a medieval peasant right. to like yeah, yeah. see someone looking through all these books it seems very impressive and learned and they would just pick up bits and sort of make it up it's a real mix of like um classic kind of folk magic i guess we could think of it and like christianity so they would take bits from the bible and read that out and incorporate that into their charms or whatever my dad always speaks about some like village witch doctor that they had and you know he was making like herbal mixtures and remedies yeah. for them and i remember my dad saying you know we just kind of like s s slapped some of this like green gunk on our chest or something if you got sick and it's like and it worked and well they got better um it, it, yeah i just wonder how um so how, how long did that continue um so well i actually have a really good example and he's referred to as um the last of the great cunning man and he was about from 1785 to 1860. Mm -hmm. So 1860, yeah. James Morrill, AKA Cunning Morrill. Uh, he's a really interesting guy. Um, this guy, uh, Eric Maple, is a folklorist I'm drawing this information from. Uh, so Cunning Morrill was the seventh son of a seventh son, or at least it looks like he might be, which is kind of a big deal. Like, have you ever heard of that before? Yes. There's something special no, about the number seven, really? Well, yeah. Especially I mean, about seven, the number seven, seven. Seven is objectively the best number. There you go. People have always been attracted to this number. Who knows why? It's one of those things in magic, actually. I think they say in magic as in stage magic, if people guess a number, they'll often guess always seven. Say seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, so people have this weird superstition about the number seven and the seventh son of the seventh son is supposed to have power because we don't see many seventh children anymore. Maybe mm -hmm. that's why magic has gone from the world. That's just so not having our kids. Correlation <laughs> is causation. <laughs> So this guy, Murrell, he claimed he could exercise malevolent spirits, destroy witches, and restore lost or stolen property to its owner, as well as providing services as an astrologer, herbalist, and animal healer. That was his Badass. remit. Yeah. Life goals. <laughs> I also love the idea of being able to, I know you said exorcise, but like exercising spirits, like I just take <laughs> them out on their morning walk. <laughs> Oh my god, I saw a great meme the other day. Um, I've been following too many like magic related um, Instagram accounts and stuff. But um, it was about how if you don't open your windows when you're burning sage, then you're not exorcising to your spirits. You're just exercising them, make them run around the room, but they don't have any way to get out. <laughs> Which memes. Anyway, so the, apparently this guy, at least um, the folklorist I was reading, Eric Maple, says that the poor people respected him. But wealthier people saw him as a dangerous quack. Mm. So again, it's like the people who don't have access to anything else, they use his services. But the people who are a bit better educated and have more resources are like, this guy's a, sh a fraud. Mm. So who knows actually what the deal was with him. But it's just an interesting, like, I think those I roles wondering... are still being fulfilled in modern society, right? Yeah, I was wondering about the class thing. And yeah, it is really interesting. And I, I, I think it's still true today in England. definitely i always think this with um so i had a friend who had oh what's that thing called um endometriosis when your um lady Jeez. area is all fucked up yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's officially what it is it means you have these terribly painful periods it's just mm. like the worst thing ever mm. it's quite common um and it's really really serious but it's very hard to get doctors to take you seriously yes. Um, and she's one of the people I know who uses alternative medicine and stuff. And in a way, I think, well, what else has she got? Like, yeah, with stuff like that, it's maddening. Of course, you would just try something. But it does annoy me to see her wasting her money. She's not the most wealthy person on stuff that I don't think is going to work. Um, but it might work. It might work. Yeah. Well, it might work, but it's very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> anyway, uh, that aside, yeah. And also, you see, this is, um, I think you have like... Uh, 
my husband's from Cape Town, we go back there every so often, and um, as you know, but for the listeners, um, there are Sangoma, who are kind of like witch, witch doctors, I guess. Um, I'm not sure if that's a derisory term, um, in Cape Town, who do all sorts of stuff. Um, and they advertise using stickers on the public rail services. Mm. So you just see these stickers with like Sangoma and then whatever his name is. Um, and he will have all, all the services he lists on there and the prices. And they do things like good luck charms, potions for virility and abortions. Mm. Those are like the things that you see most often. So that mixture of medicine for people who can't access real medicine um, Western mm. medicine, whatever you want to call it, um, and also magic. That is still a connection that's going on today all over the world. A ritual abortion. Yeah, I know. I imagine this is just a straight up abortion. Yeah. Uh, it's just something you don't have access to from anyone else other than a witch doctor. If you can't get a real doctor, you know. Yeah. It's... D- did you find, I mean, did you look at like shamans in a, sorry, my, my mic moved, uh, <laughs> like in, like southern uh, latin america and stuff like i didn't take a deep dive in shamans just because i was already yeah pretty no, overwhelmed with the research but yeah but yeah so basically the the shaman's role is uh they're a conduit between this world and the other world and they are they are mainly one of the big things they do they do do herbal medicine and stuff but i th- the general gist i got is that shamans are mainly about going into other sort of states um, altered states with and healing is very back. much like a central yeah yeah yeah. but they do it by either going into a different altered state themselves or putting sure. their people into an altered state it's not they don't make charms and stuff so much or i didn't see no, so much of that ritual being like a big thing yes well. a huge thing yeah this is again interesting about like the overlap and the differences between all of these different modalities like we're all trying to get to the same results but it's like how different cultures um take like how it shows up in different cultures is interesting yeah and it's really fun to spot the similarities as well because i feel like when i see a similarity i'm like oh that must be something pretty basic and human yeah like we've all done this and we were talking about this with spirit animals right you see every culture has some form of spirit animals so that to me suggests that this must be a very like fundamental part of what it is to be human that we anthropomorphize the natural world yeah but perhaps not such a fundamental part of being human is ceremonial magic so now we're moving on to like if you think you're stereotype of a magician, like, I don't know, he's got all weird symbols around, wearing a pointy hat, robe, that guy, yep. he is inspired by <laughs> ceremonial magicians. Um, and this is basically 15th and 16th century, all across Europe. Um, and they're all communicating with each other now because they can write letters and they can publish little booklets of their, their ideas and their spells and their philosophies. So there's a much more movement around that. It's, and the difference between what we are just talking about with like the cunning folk and these magician guys is is it's kind of a class difference actually it's uh so it's often described as high magic and low magic high magic is ceremonial low magic is folk magic um Mm. people say this isn't uh you know like one's better than the other high and low um although i think a lot of people think they are uh it's more like high magic is about um contacting the divine low Mm. magic is about practical effects um the other big difference is that high magic is you have to learn all these rituals and you have to get the books and you have to like study it whereas low magic is much more intuitive and something you're just sort of the mm-hmm. cunning people are actually doing a mix of both but um and it's interesting how our workshop kind of touched on that idea of like following the books versus um you doing it into it intuitively yeah definitely um the so we've got so basically we've got all these people basically they're rich weirdos all across Europe sending their messages back and forth coming up with ideas to basically it's more like the Thelema thing because they're they're interested in the divine they're interested in contacting the divine and they want a direct conduit they don't want to go via religion yeah so this is quite a kind of I mean when we talked about Crowley this is like a rejection of a lot of traditions Uh, and their texts like are they making them up? Are they getting them from like ancient Greece? Like- a, b- a bit a mix and match. Cause that's mm. of course the other interesting thing about the 15th, 16th century is suddenly they have access to stuff. So they have access to Arabic astrology, Jewish Kabbalah mm. and all the Christian sources. And they are just going crazy, mixing them all yeah. up, trying different things. They have a very like experimental sounds like, attitude. Sounds like Twitter. 
yeah, yeah exactly mm -hmm. uh so the the group that sort of formalized all this stuff formalized ceremonial magic as a path of spiritual self-development which is kind of like what we see in thelema today is the golden dawn yeah so they're founded by freemasons so they already have that kind of like they were called friendly societies these groups of people who look out for each other they generally put money into a central pot and help each other out it's kind of like an insurance policy but also like a club of people who are friends and help each other out in their um you know like community uh, yeah exactly it's a community um but it's a community that you join and that you're committed to through initiation practices and stuff so that's like the freemasons um a, a couple of them broke off and started the golden dawn and they founded their first temple in 1887 mm -hmm. and they're they're taking people through this very formal structured thing of like you learn to meditate then you learn to do this then you learn to do that and you're every step you're getting to be a better more evolved more spiritual and more powerful magician which is the group that alistair crowley joins as we all know or crowley mm. i should say yeah. yeah it just doesn't stick does it it um, doesn't i keep <laughs> oh man uh, i did when we were in the workshop i did say it right and I like yeah. looked around to see if anyone would challenge me, but they didn't. So uh, I guess I said it was such authority. Um, so Crowley joins the Golden Dawn in 1898. And we all know how that goes. But the important addition that he made to magical practice and his sort of legacy on, on magic is he brought drugs, which is interesting because, of course, like we we're talking about with shaman, that's shamanism. A, altered states were a big part of that kind of very classical mm -hmm. old school like high i don't magic. know even what to call it yeah um but he's bringing it into high magic so that, it was oh no it wouldn't be high magic with the shamans no it? much more intuitive yeah. so it's like a, a blend he's bringing yeah. that and that's because he has access to these texts and also access to a lot of drugs <laughs> and so he's yeah so that's bringing the shamanic style back and sex of course yeah as we're very familiar with <laughs> another way to enter extreme sort of altered states so that's the kind of the history of magic as i see it from a very brief romp through it is it starts with sort of what we might think of as proto-shamanic sympathetic magic with people mm. living in caves and then um it sort of splits off and these high magic and low magic yeah. are two separate things practiced and there's a class division there and there's probably also a gender division i didn't pay that much attention mm. to it but i feel like even though the golden golden door did accept female initiates as we discussed on the crowley episode he was a bit of a misogynist and i think there were definitely more male magicians than female and oh. then at some point these are coming back together now yeah. so we're seeing the ritual stuff the drugs and the intuitive stuff all together unfortunately we didn't do any drugs in our candle magic workshop <laughs> but what we were looking at that that's all informed by this these two disciplines that split off from some kind of common root. Yeah, that is beautiful. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really <laughs> enjoyable. I'm not even kidding. That was great. Um, and yeah, you you did touch on the gender thing, and I'm not going to go massively into it, but I do think it comes up in contemporary magic, mm. which I'll move on to. So I'm just going to kind of jump straight to the 1990s, though I do think it kind of kicks off with Crowley. Like I think where you ended, it does technically pick up there. Um, in terms of like, he got so famous in the early uh, 20th century that in that way, like he kind of made it, I guess he made it more accessible. People were aware of magic and maybe um, it hadn't been so, uh, it had been more underground before. I don't know if you think that's the yeah, case. Yeah, I think it's probably um, a combination of like all sorts of things, but probably publishing, the history of publishing, suddenly people could get yeah. access to his books. Because when he, was, when he was originally publishing some of his books, he was literally like just printing pamphlets. Right. And then, you know, in the 90s, you could go buy the book of the law from the mind, body, spirit section of Waterstones yeah. or whatever. So it's a massive change. Yeah, no, for sure. And as I, I think I'm just going to start with the 90s, and keep it really contemporary, basically. You know, that was still like, what, fucking like 30 years ago. <laughs> Um, not to anyway. me <laughs> <laughs> so growing up i don't know about you rebecca we're, we're sort of like late mid to late 80s babies mm. um the crafts like oh, so, so yeah. definitely in in films and tv magic was actually a big part of like a lot of our youth so i remember that was a favorite um i did find a great article from esquire which we'll put in the show notes which is basically about um the politics 
of that time and talking about how witchcraft the occult came up in movies and tv shows a lot in the 90s and reflected politics i'm not one to speak about it but it's a great article <laughs> we'll, we'll link to it um so we have had, a theory about why uh just how well i remember finding out in psychology that just it happens always that um, oh, it's like movies cyclical. reflect well it's more like it's the zeitgeist it's like this is what's happening and directors happen to make movies about what's going on deliberately or otherwise uh, okay yeah independence day you know like when aliens landed like aliens were landing <laughs> on, no um so sabrina the teenage witch a fucking yeah i remember that, of that. Uh, was in that he was he was <laughs> gosh such a great show um in september 1996 and then buffy debuted uh buffy the vampire slayer debuted in march 97 whoa it was in 97 i know i was surprised by both those numbers i was like yeah damn like this was my youth these are the yeah me too blonde like american like californian <laughs> girls kicking ass basically and doing some magic and their popularity only increased over the next few years especially amongst young women like ourselves um and the film practical magic i love um, that movie have you yeah, seen it so oh, good, so good. <laughs> I, I, reading through all of these i was like oh my god yeah uh, why wasn't i a witch um the original charmed i didn't watch that so much no i wasn't into that um but i had friends who were it was just and a bit of... well, yeah yeah for sure um <laughs> there's that really hot girl in it i can't remember Alyssa milano was she in it i don't know um so each don't of those made me you... start google imaging hot girls <laughs> you won't get me back for the rest of the episode hot magic girls <laughs> but um each of those use like elements of witchcraft and the occult to demonstrate what can happen when women basically do tap into their abilities i didn't realize this until i was researching i was like oh yeah that that is a theme um yeah, it's like women it's are pretty like, dominant in the 90s especially in the craft like it's like mm. a it's almost like magic is used as a metaphor for them coming yeah. into like their sexual whatever yeah. like power yeah definitely um i also think it's interesting that the the generation now getting into magic were probably also into harry potter when they were kids like i was nine when i read the first harry potter book like inappropriate age to be reading harry potter <laughs> when it came out and like grew up with that and, and grew up with that world of just being so into this idea of you know, getting through those painful years of like you know when you're a teenager and then you're a teenager just really wanting to spells i didn't go the whole way like some people did but um yeah so i thought it was interesting i also found out more more currently we've got people like lana del rey apparently she's like witchy oh really um, she tried to hex donald trump to stop him winning the election <laughs> yeah there was a whole big thing about that there were lots i don't remember of, that at all yeah there were lots of witchy folk doing um hexes and spells and they even had they had a, like a i can't remember what it's called but they had a hashtag for it um so they could all get together and do it at the same time and they might have and and this is actually something that was happening uh, uh, kind of a whole period i skipped out because we talked about it in our wicker episode is wicker and its influence on magic um but that was a big thing like the feminist wicker um yeah. was very much about like not even necessarily thinking of magic as something supernatural but the power of when women organize and how right. they could push back against the patriarchy there's a reddit um thing what they called subreddit called witches versus patriarchy now it's very active oh, so it's still wow. like a it's a big deal nice it feels empowering i guess mm. um we've also got movies and i don't, haven't actually seen any of these movies like the love witch <gasps> have you not watched that yet i have not you and your husband have both told me to watch this film several times you're gonna not... love it it's <laughs> it's just so you because it's like very very visual and like striking and because you like old movies cat likes yes. old movies um and it's not got that like fast narrative um you know bash 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 it's got lots of stuff just for the sake of it being beautiful and strange and then oh that, okay fine i will watch it um <laughs> the witch which i think i did watch <gasps> that's also very good um in a completely different way and hereditary is by the same or no hereditary and Suspiria is by the same director doesn't matter uh and tv shows like the chilling adventures of sabrina Oh yeah, did you watch oh, was that, that the reboot? No. Yeah. There's also it, a less popular reboot of Charmed apparently. Oh, I didn't know about that at all. No, I did watch like the first series of the reboot of Sabrina and I was kind of into it because it was very aesthetically pleasing, but mm. it was I mean it's aimed at a younger age group than my age group. It's aimed at the age I was when I enjoyed Buffy. 
which yeah, is which actually I, this age. So. We, we, we found out you can rewatch old things, but it's hard getting into things made for that people that age. Yeah, I think it's because you can like you can you can go back to how you experienced it as a teenager and go back mm. into your teenage self and watch it for that. But I didn't watch this thing as a teenager and so I watch it now and I'm just like well this is just oh, yeah. programming for you know for people in their late teens early 20s no no shade on anyone who enjoys it because it is beautiful and the stories are kind of interesting but it just wasn't for me because I'm way too grown up <laughs> and sophisticated she says when she's like re-watching Buffy for the fourth yeah. time no that's, um, that's cool, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, and also I just wanted to mention series is like The Haunting of Hill House have you seen that? No, I haven't, but isn't it? It's, I think it's based on a movie that I've seen. And American Horror Story Apocalypse. Yeah, and the, there's a whole series of American Horror Story, Coven, which is about uh, witches too. So all of these have been using the occult, supernatural, but also to com on, comment on everything from the consequences of privilege to the lasting effects of trauma, all very hot topics. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, do you think magic is back in fashion for its own sake? Or do you think magic is just sort of in fashion as a lens through which to talk about things we're interested in anyway? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, because I'm not interested in a lot of these like political things necessarily. I don't think I am. Um, mm. But maybe I can explore them through entertaining shows where they're like talking cats and stuff. I'll get <laughs> me interested in politics. Um, <laughs> it, so like, yeah, as a sort of lens, but that's just what media has always done. It reflects what is going on in the real world yeah um, i guess that's true but i like the idea of it especially with those the 90s kind of feminist ones just being like you know that was the era of spice girls like girl power and stuff and how actually that would have been quite a useful outlet for people you know as a 12 year old girl i wasn't really thinking about what it means to be a feminist um but seeing these kind of heroines on tv was probably helpful in some way yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's interesting um but i also so, just go on no i was go on you go on um i was gonna go, go on to the websites but continue if you've got anything else on no i was just i was gonna segue into chaos magic but tell me about the oh, websites no first. just a couple I, yeah it would be good to just talk about um some recommendations because googling around like it's actually quite hard to find well you know like the way in like if you're a total noob like i i am i was like tell me about magic guys how can i learn um tell me the podcasts and like the youtube channels i can you know watch and one of the first things i found was a subreddit which said so i think it's like best resources on youtube to learn magic i believe that was the question posed i also had that question <laughs> and that one of the last comments was please don't learn magic on youtube yeah fair enough like you can imagine something similar like coming up with astrology and somebody being like just don't learn it on astrology like get a teacher um which i you know you can't really deny the um the truth in that to an extent um but i also think it's important that we share resources so people can kind of get a feel about this magic stuff because i don't think i am going to be able to find a magic mentor very easily yeah you <laughs> like know, where like, are you supposed to find them Exactly. I mean, we could go back to the um, the Crowley folk and that might be cool. But like, yeah, it's it, what annoys me is when people try to be deliberately obscure. Yeah. And that was a lot of the stuff I found. Um, and I think there's an appeal in it, in, in any of these kind of like secret arts. Um, people like to be part of like a secret club. And I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I, I'm, more, I'm more of a spread the power to the people <laughs> yeah and it's like um, the other thing is the the sort of dismissal of people like um the, hey, it's actually interesting talking about the way that uh religion talks about other religions have in the past talked about other religions as being superstition and magic whereas our religion is the real thing and you see that in the magical community you're like they call them fluff bunny witches sometimes <laughs> this idea of these silly little people experimenting on youtube with magic but i'm the serious practitioner mm -hmm. i've got the real stuff and it's like well you're always going to think you're the best aren't you like, yeah, exactly. You're, and again, it comes back to that kind of like the private club mm. back in like Golden Dawn times. Because it has um, more, it's more special, the more, um, uh, you know, the less people you let in, the more people you let yeah. into your club, the less special you can think of yourself and all your friends who are in the club. No, completely. Um, I, I like, so, so some people are doing really great work. So podcasts like Rune Soup, uh, Toth Hermes, that's where I heard this guy, um, Freighter Acker. 
who I'm obsessed with. <laughs> the, one, the best website I know on this is theomagica.com. And I actually found this guy when I was researching the diamond and he's oh. got this amazing book. I think it's called like the Holy Diamond or something like that. And it's the best book I've read about contacting your HGA, basically, your Holy Guardian Angel. Oh my God, we're going diamond. into so much lingo now. <laughs> he's, been, he's, he's, he's a, a thalamite. <laughs> he's a thalamite, right? Kind of. Because that's where the freighter thing comes from. Oh, is on, it really? Oh, yeah, yeah so he must so. be. Oh. Oh, or it might come that. just from the AA or from the Golden Earth, but it's that yeah that world that family sure. of things because everyone we met on the from the local thelemites they're all afraid of this and afraid of that yeah well he's got some amazing um resources on his website it's also very aesthetic and i just wanted to kind of um pop that in there just about the aesthetics right now it like it's so appealing good yeah good like oh, all the magic stuff it's so like altars sigils talismans old books like it's just so appealing and I can't even describe but and I think it's appealing to a particular generation of people mm. right now like I don't think my dad would see one of these websites and be like oh I so want to get into like hermeticism and like <laughs> we'll get, get into all of these old things it's just it feels really novelty and uh, yeah appealing yeah no I, I I the aesthetics is a huge draw for me and I always feel a bit like uh superficial or silly for saying that because it's like oh well it's just how it looks but Come on, art is powerful. We should yeah. both recognise that as people who work in artistic fields. And I wonder if it's always been appealing to an extent because it's still the sensory appeal of all of this has always been valid, even when you're talking about the cave paintings. Yeah. And stuff. It's like, it's always had a really sensual um, appeal. Magic is um, a really tactile thing. It's kind of not just something you click around on your computer and maybe that's another appeal for it for us to be doing something that is with our hands and our eyes and taste everything it's, it engages every sense yeah that's that's a really good point although it does go against um me and my husband have been talking about the idea of making some kind of uh, virtual reality magical space well it definitely engages one sense and then you could kind of bring your own in you can just bring in the glass of wine and yeah uh, good like point. A, a young like always virgin. bring in a glass of wine and a virgin <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, um, that's your advice for everything <laughs> I don't know what's happened to me this episode. So let's hear about some chaos magic. Yeah, so it's interesting when you were just talking about how, um, you know, this kind of feminist magic aspect. And I do think that's definitely coming from the uh, the wicker that bounces over to the US in like the 60s or whatever, gets mixed up with feminism and just creates this amazing new religion which comes back to the UK, which is what I encountered when I first encountered Wicca. But yeah, it's very, very female focused. Um, and I mean, Wicca varies, but a lot of Wicca is focused on worshipping, if they're worshipping any deity, it'll usually be a goddess, um, sometimes a god and a goddess. Um, and this is all informed by that. But then there's these sort of more masculine approaches to magic, I guess you could think of them as, or at least most of the people practicing them seem to be of the more masculine persuasion. And one of them that was really interesting to me, and actually I remember back in the day uh, when I was high priestess of a coven, my high priest had a book on chaos magic and I was always like, ooh, but I never um, borrowed it for whatever reason. Um, and it's probably lucky I didn't, <laughs> as you go on to see. But um, so chaos magic, this is the hot magic right now. This is the magic everyone's talking about, or at least everyone who's like, has tattoos, is generally male, has I mean it's those tech bros, but it's yeah. like a slightly rougher flavor of tech bro, well, like a punk tech bro. Yeah, no, I I know them. Literally, yes. like that archetype I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. They're awesome. So the, these are the guys you'll meet. They're they're lovely guys, but rough around the edges. But that's how we like them. So, uh, so chaos magic isn't really a type of magic. Uh, it's a descriptive paradigm of how magic works. So you could be doing, you know, you could be out with your crystals and you could be saying hello to fairy folk and lighting candles or dancing around or doing more ceremonial things and drawing pentagrams on the walls. The, it's like the approach that you're taking is the chaos magic bit, not what you're doing. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So basically it's the idea, and this is going to sound very similar to Alastair Crowley, uh, is you go into a trance state, 
and you can get there by many different means. Uh, I'll talk about some of them later. You focus your will. So that is about really focusing on what you want. And again, we're talking about will in the thelemic sense. So it's not just what you desire, but what your like your true self really mm-hmm. needs and what's right for you. And by doing that, you affect change in the world. This is how almost all chaos magic things go. And to be honest, most magic things go. You could, that probably could describe the candle magic thing we did. And the reason why it works is because you create your own reality. This is a general belief of chaos magicians. And if you're thinking this sounds a lot like the law of attraction, yeah. then you're very right. <laughs> it's just such a different group of people doing such a similar thing. And I'm sure chaos magicians will be offended by this. But um, like, whether it's like a middle class white woman putting pictures yeah. on a cork board and burning some incense or like the cool punk tech bro, you know, doing his big sigils or whatever on his wall and spray paint and listening to napalm death or whatever they do. Mm. The, the actual action that they're performing is very, very similar. Yeah, totally. And the reason it has this kind of vibe, the kind of punky vibe is because it came up in the 1970s. So predating, well, I don't know, actually, I was going to say predating law of attraction, but there's a, I haven't looked into that, so I won't. And I want to say the secret law. was written in the 80s. Yeah, but I think there's this whole, the new thought movement. Well, that um, was 1920s. It. Yeah, so maybe they're drawing from similar sources. Mm. Anyway, the star people who start calling themselves um, chaos magicians and talking about chaos magic, um, there's two big names, Peter Carroll and Ray Sherwin, and I'll come around to them in a minute. But you've got to remember, like, in this time, you know, like how people thought of quantum physics in the 80s and the 90s, like, whoa, man, it could prove anything. It's this crazy, amazing thing. Um, A lot of people still think like that. Um, People thought about chaos theory that way in the 70s and 80s, basically. Like, no one really understood what it was, but they knew it was, you know, intellectual and amazing. So being connected with the word chaos, chaos magic. And this is what made me think it was really cool when I saw that book on the shelf in the 90s, like, chaos magic. Oh. Um, but actually it's not really got much to do with chaos theory at all um, I looked everywhere to try and find someone making a link but no one really was um, it's just a link maybe just in my mind but I reckon in a lot of people's mind because there's lots of other people asking the same question um, it's basically chaos is uh, the world before we perceive it so everything out there outside your own head is just a crazy mess of light and sound and colour and material and it doesn't mean anything at all. And then we look at it through our human eyes and our human brains and we give it meaning. So chaos is, I guess it's everything. And we are the agents that create meaning out of that chaos. And I'm kind of going along with this to some degree, because I do think that there isn't any inherent meaning in the world, which if you listen to our ayahuasca episode, you'll hear me ramble on about for some time. Um, it's nothing, there is nothing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, the question is, can you, as they claim, is ever, so this is this thing that keeps coming up. And I talked to the, in my interview with Mark, um, we were talking about this and he said, this common phrase you hear is nothing is true. Everything is permitted, which sounds really mm-hmm. cool. And I think when he said it, I was just like, yeah, it's cool, man. And I couldn't even <laughs> think of a response, but, um, it's kind of been rolling around in my head since we spoke. Um, and it's basically like a very postmodern attitude towards truth. Uh, They're encouraging people to be agnostic about everything. Like don't fully believe anything, Mm. let everything, you know, which I think is fairly sensible. Although I do think like you proportion your beliefs to the evidence. So you don't have to say I'm hundred percent sure of anything, but there are some things I'm more sure about than others. Mm. Um, So like postmodernism gets a really bad rap, or I guess it depends what circles you're in. Um, but if you Google postmodernism, there's a lot of people who really don't like it. Uh, I studied some postmodern theory at university way, way back. Um, and my, I know, and my, my impression was pretty good. I mean, like, the postmodernism is about being skeptical of grand narratives. So like those big stories, like, you know, um, the government is all good and it should control everything about your life. That would be a grand narrative. Um, the patriarchy might be a grand narrative, like I don't know, gender roles, or that's, that's like a grand narrative that we believe. Um, the monetary system, people would say capitalism, um, all these things are like religion. 
okay, that's, that's, a, that's a great example, religion, because at this point, the postmodernists are coming up and s slowly religion is sort of unraveling at this stage. So, so this is the 70s, postmodernism is hot, and people are saying, I'm not so sure about all those things we were really sure about, not so sure about them anymore. And I think we should encourage people to be skeptical of them, which I think is obviously as a skeptic, really good. The kind of way that postmodernism rolled on down into the culture was more like what these chaos magicians are saying. It's like, nothing is true. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not quite what the original dudes are saying. The original dudes are saying, let's think about everything carefully and unpick these narratives and see if they really stack up and if they serve us. What people, many people seem to be saying now, especially among this chaos magic crowd is, everything is relative. Nothing means That's anything. You can do whatever you want. Um, mm -hmm. So it's easy to just say, oh, it's all postmodernism's fault, but I don't think that's quite true anyway. And this is why, like, Jordan Peterson hates postmodernism. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't really hate postmodernism, or I don't know what he hates. I don't know what his deal is. <laughs> <laughs> Go back and listen to our Jordan Peterson episode. Um, but yeah, he hates relativism, basically, and you can see why. Um, but being skeptical of grand narratives, great idea. And that's what a lot of the postmodernism things are. I think this can only happen in a pretty privileged culture because. Like, you can't say nothing is true, everything is made up when you're tr struggling to get food on the table for your family. Exactly, yeah. I've, I feel like I've come across this point recently in something else. And it, 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 it's um, that whole, just the idea of chaos is much easier for us to deal with in our, like, wealthy Western world, yeah. basically. It would be interesting. I wonder whether this is a common thing that happens as cultures get to a certain point of development where everyone's at a certain level of comfort and then they're like, oh, we should start questioning all our assumptions. Hooray, question let's assumptions. And then, yeah, the next step is let's tear it all down. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's, just, let's only tear down the bits that need tearing down, please. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so this basically, this postmodern attitude to truth um, encourages them to think of belief instead of, so the classic sort of skeptical perspective on truth is the correspondence theory of truth. So something is true when what you believe conforms to objective reality. Classic. Uh, that's not how they think about belief at all. They think of belief as a tool because everything is chaos. Belief is just a sort of a set of assumptions, like a networked set of assumptions that help you navigate the world. So if a it doesn't really matter if it's a if it corresponds to reality, if it helps you in your life, you should believe oh, it. I think I'm a bit like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I was reading like this. And I was like, oh, I don't want Kat to pick up any books on chaos magic. She's full <laughs> mental. <laughs> well, I don't like all the relative stuff, but I like, I kind of like that. I find it really hard to think I can get an objective belief or truth. And anyway, it is super struggle. hard. Yeah. And it is probably easier to just be like, well, I'll just have whatever suits me at the moment. But I get. Like, I can see the danger in that as well, and I don't yeah. feel like necessarily good about that either. I don't necessarily want that. It's just where I'm. At. Yeah, I think it's a very human place to be. I, I think it's like. I think you have to have a certain amount of intelligence to think like that. No, no offense to anyone who actually has solid beliefs, but. Yeah, because if you if you believe if you're very very certain that something is absolutely true, then you. I well, know, like... no, this is. I think it's like a loop. It's like you you start as a kid you don't really question things until maybe you start asking why but like let's say at the beginning you have no reason to question anything once you gain a bit of intelligence about the world then you start questioning it and ideally i think the next step is then coming back around and then getting some firmer beliefs i don't think i've just reached that point yet <laughs> it's a simple little simple like, diagram but I think no it's... yeah i think that's that's actually a good way to think about it because what you do is you start perhaps you start with certainty you start questioning things and then you realize oh that certainty that i had when i was a kid or whenever like back then that wasn't real so i've got to get comfortable with the fact that i can only be like 99.9% .9 sure about even the most obvious things mm. and that's really difficult because we like to be sure about things and that's when the temptation just to slip into dogmatism comes it's like well it's much easier to just be like to say no i'm going back to that original certainty that felt so good mm. um but getting comfortable like with this kind of like uh you know like provisional certainty like i'm pretty sure that science is the best way to understand the world right now until something better comes along but i'm not saying it's like 
and I will promote it and I think it's brilliant um but I would never say 100% sure about anything mm. anyway so this this is so interesting though this idea to me of because your beliefs are just a tool you can choose what they are and this is exactly what so the book um the book I read is by Peter Carroll one of the guys who kicked this whole thing off or at least one of the big you know leading lights um it's called Liber Null. It's like two books put together, actually, the way I read it. Liber Null and Psychonaut. And it's very, very similar to the Thelemite practices in that ceremonial magic is a big part of it. Lots of meditation. But he is talking about the idea of picking apart your personality and demonstrating to yourself that you can change things that you think are fundamental about your personality. So he suggests taking beliefs and just cancelling them and putting in a new one. Like things like this, which I think, I don't know if it's possible. And I think it would take, and I think when you read about chaos magic, you hear people talking, you know, either saying just things that sound like completely insane or people saying this doesn't work, this is stupid. And I think to, yeah. to get any effect from it, you would have to practice it for so long and put so much work into it that most people who are playing around with it probably don't, you know, get those effects. I agree. I think this is a really interesting subject. Like, can you choose your beliefs? And I'm, yeah. I'm I haven't really come down on anything that I've been trying to push that myself in being like, how did I come to believe what I believe? You know, and, and you have these different sources and, and reasons for that. And like some, like what we could call evidence, even if it's faulty evidence, it's like, well, that's my evidence. But why? Like, I, yeah. I don't think we can choose those original seeds that make you pick certain beliefs. And I say, make you it's something in you. I don't think it's necessarily a conscious thing that's picking the belief. Yeah. Mm, anyway, no, I, it's yeah, I agree. Interesting. It's a very strange. So one of the best books I read when I was looking to chaos magic and everyone listening should go out and get this book. Cause it's really good. Um, it's called, she said, I was like, this is the best book ever. Let me just find out what it was called. It's called, um, the KLF, um, chaos magic and the band that burned a million pounds. It's by John Hicks. Um, and I had it like on my reading list because I, someone I thought was kind of cool and clever uh, mentioned it. But I, because it was about a band I never heard of, I was like, well, I'm yeah. never going to read that really. But in theory, I'll read it. And then I had the opportunity to research Chaos Magic. So I dug in. And you don't need to know anything about the KLF. They're like an acid house band from the early 90s. Uh, but they're like an art project band. They're very strange. And they did actually burn a million pounds. And it's just su such a brilliant book. But uh, he explores what they did basically he starts with them burning a million pounds and then he says how do we understand this act because they say they don't understand why they did it and he tries to explore it through the prism of discordianism and chaos magic and discordianism wow. is kind of like the religion of worshiping chaos but oh, yeah that's a whole different thing geez, anyway <laughs> he talks about um this guy uh robert anton wilson who is mm, the pope of discordianism. i love him yeah so you'll love discordianism maybe oh. <laughs> um it's a cool religion it kind of started as a parody but got real yeah anyway so he talks about this concept of the self-referential reality tunnel which I think is really, really useful. I'll just quote him. He says, a philosophy, religion, or ideology that was complete and satisfying and which fully explained all the details of the world, assuming that you did not question its central tenant. The surrounding ideology was an elaborate commentary which developed in order to support the central concept in much the same way that a pearl forms around a piece of grit in an oyster. So the chaos, like the coolest chaos magic people, I think, are the ones who are really digging deep into what they believe mm -hmm. and finding those unquestioned assumptions and seeing what has accreted around them. This is kind of what we talk about when we talk about um, interpretive drift, how you can like just sort of drift into having a belief mm -hmm. that you never really yeah. intended to have. Um, so yeah, they, they, they are very interested in the psychology. I guess they wouldn't call it psychology necessarily because they're exploring it through art and through poetry in all sorts of strange ways but they're interested in how our beliefs put together and how they can mm. manipulate them for their and they think of things like you know mainstream religions christianity would be a great example of a self-referential reality tunnel and their <laughs> their idea is to not get into any of those to remain agnostic to all of those and be able to dip in and out of different beliefs when they want uh, so the book Liber Null that i started talking about whenever i started talking about peter carroll's book is a whole it's kind of an instruction manual for 
deconstructing your personality um, because he believes the more things you believe are true about yourself, the more limited you are. And then once all that's cleared off, you can open up to, I don't know if he uses this phrase, but as I understand it, the true will, which is what exactly what Thelemites are going for and what people in the Golden Dawn were going for and all that ceremonial ma um, magic stuff is all about finding the, I'm doing inverted commas here, the true essence of yourself yeah. so that you can live your best life. If you're it's slide. the same I guess isn't it like the goal of like Jungian kind of work it's like you're trying to connect with the self yeah exactly um, and they're very very informed by Jung in fact mm. that's going to come up in a minute so the, but there are some practical things I mean I would, like I don't want to leave people with like oh but how do I do chaos magic so there are some it's uh so this guy Aus, Austin Osmond Spare who never called his work um chaos magic but he's a big inspiration it's like an old school occultist um he came up with the idea of sigils i believe um and then they've sort of developed in the practice and they're very very simple to do um so what you have to do and this is going to remind you so much of what we did in the candle magic you have to boil down your will to one or two words write them down take out the repeated letters and vowels and mush them together to create a kind of cool looking occulty symbol draw that symbol make sure it looks really good charge it and by charge it they mean very similar to what we did in the candle magic workshop focus your energy your energy focus all your attention on it and then obviously you can charge things in like different ways so uh, a classic way would be just to to stare at it and think about your in, what you want to achieve um but because these are chaos magic bros they like to do a bit of drugs so maybe they'll go into sort of trance state aided by drugs and focus on it that way but what they like to do most of all because they're inspired by Crowley is a little bit of sex magic so Count me in. That, that's your classic way to charge a sigil you can you can have sex with your partner and just at the moment of orgasm think about your sigil or you can just wank off into the piece of paper with it written on <laughs> you know. what really <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's not the phrases they use i'm so glad people can't see me gesturing to explain these actions uh yeah and then very vital once you've charged it you have to destroy it mentally and often physically so you have to get it out you of destroy your head. the oh. evidence of your dirty yeah, exactly <laughs> so you can burn your sigil you can throw it in the sea was one suggestion <laughs> just throwing your <laughs> You're staying right. in the right. city. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you have to immediately shift your mental state to something else. Um, Peter Carroll suggests laughing, like just start hysterically okay. laughing. Nice. These are the kind of guys they are. I saw an amazing talk by Grant Morrison, um, who's a comic book artist. And this is a big thing for comic book artists. Uh, I'm going to talk about Alan Moore briefly as well. But um, he starts the talk just by screaming wow. like a madman. Like they're really like. They're very vital people yeah. who don't give a shit what anyone thinks of them. So you can see why this is attractive. But yeah, I'll just tell you a little bit about Alan Moore because I couldn't help but get into the comic book side of it because that's my interest. So he's basically, his, his idea is that we all have these idea spaces, um, but there is like, so idea spaces is like your, what you believe about the world. Um, and all your thoughts and stuff. And then there's a communal idea space. And uh, that's kind of what Jung would call the collective unconscious. I would just call it our culture. Um, and he thinks that you could create ideas in your idea space that roam off into other idea spaces. And this is basically what you're doing with a sigil. Sigil's like step one. The next step would be to create a kind of like a thought form, which is drawing on sort of theosophy ideas. That you can create a little character if you just think about it hard enough and then it will roam about and do your bidding and then an egregore is the next step up where that's a collective thought form we have multiple people thinking about it and it's really interesting because i see this as a way to think about our culture and how we interact with it and as an artist alan moore is obviously very concerned about that because that's what he does so it doesn't surprise me at all that there are so many cool arty people who are involved in this and thinking about how you can create ideas that affect your whole culture um, right. so it just seems like a different, a different lens through which to see, like there's two sides of it. So there's the people who are doing kind of self-development, divine magic type stuff. And then the people who are just using it as a, a sort of a lens through which to understand culture and they cross over and the people in the cultural side often are pretty, you know, skeptical and kind of chill. And the people on the other side are often 
a little bit bonkers, but there's, it's definitely a really interesting area that I think is going to become it's going to become more of a big deal as more people think about it because it does actually give you some useful ways of thinking about things that are quite complicated like yeah. memetics and the way ideas move around between us especially with the internet yeah that's that's way more than i thought chaos magic was that's cool. <laughs> yeah me too i was really like oh I'll just talk a little bit about chaos magic it's just those you know those dudes that's what they do but yeah it's deep and i really really recommend the klf book that yeah. that made me take it seriously basically reading that cool so do you want to like start to wrap up but i just wanted to talk about the ethics of magic oh yeah so this is quite opinion based but i couldn't help but question it um it came up a bit in the workshop as well just like you know is it right that we should be um if it's true then then should we be doing it mm. um and you know especially with your story when you like get somebody fired <laughs> basically and i think it's quite obvious that like black magic is bad and i i don't know maybe you have a better definition of black magic for me but yeah kind of what you did it's like if you're trying to affect the will of another person especially in a negative way but even in a positive way maybe but definitely in a negative way <laughs> surely that's just like punching somebody in the face it's just you're you're wishing it or doing yeah. a spell it's complicated isn't it because we all affect it i thought this when we talked about the lemur and their general attitude you shouldn't interfere with other people's will but that's literally what it is to be a human you, you basically can't avoid affecting other people's will mm. as soon as you do anything it's i think it's obvious though that we shouldn't tr try to cause harm to anyone yeah the problem is it's like when does it become harm like if i say you know the woman for example she was like you can't wish that dude is going to marry you because that's unethical yeah because that might be against his will um, and then it's kind of like a battle of wills, but then isn't that life as well? Yeah, it's, uh, this is another thing that the chaos magic guys are pretty kind of chill about. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. they don't really see any problem with doing black magic. Like it's it, again, it may be inspired by Crowley, you know, it's just like a battle of wills. Yeah. It's almost like, well, I was kind of comparing it to like taking a multivitamin or something like a supplement that works. Um, <laughs> well skeptical um i'm taking an action to give myself an advantage if my neighbor doesn't take the multivitamin like to give himself an advantage that's his choice so i yeah. can't be held responsible for the lack of action of another that's true so if, that you, feels do, like, if you do a spell to make that man marry you and he doesn't think to do a spell to resist marrying to, to, you that's exactly. his own fault it's, basically <laughs> i'm glad you've cleared my um conscience on that so if we can control uh, this and this is kind of like another leg of it like which is maybe broader and more philosophical and i'd be interested in hearing your perspective on this though i think i know what it's going to be well <laughs> like if we can control our fate should we oh and my problem with this is i do basically believe in a fairly high degree of fate um that i think there's a likelihood of certain events that will unfold um which obviously can be ref seen reflected in the sky with astrology um but in in that sense it's describing a natural course of action um that's just kind of like you know events playing themselves out and if we have some wiggle room which i also believe can we like maybe take advantage of that wiggle room through magic like maybe magic gives us more wiggle room this has been believed for like thousands of years um people would do you know um pray to venus for something mm. uh but like and i guess if, if magic is real um that and i and, and i use my wiggle room for my own um like earthly desires is that right or wrong and i'm just i i guess i'm more in the camp that says it's not it's going against the natural flow of things like um it's it's delaying my progress on this path it's and difficult yeah it's it feels like you're going well yeah you're going against the will of the higher power of god of whatever you want to call it when you start using things like magic but or why use... why is magic different like yeah exactly that's another point it's like maybe it's just a tool like a multivitamin that got placed if, on earth if magic is a natural law like any i mean like i'm mm. just going with you in your flight yeah, of fancy please do. <laughs> um, if, if magic is real and you can affect the world with it how is it any different from language 
like you could say oh I wouldn't want to go and talk to that person because that would be affecting the natural world mm. you know that would be like destroying my fate and you like then the only answer is just complete inaction yeah right and some spiritual paths would say like that is the only right way like, yeah go sit just, in a cave yeah basically so so anyway it does feel like the very opposite of sitting in the cave because it's like taking ultimate action it's not even using regular laws it's like using these like magical laws mm. so that's what i mean i feel like it's at the extreme end of getting things that we want and let's face it pretty much all magic is about getting what we want and i don't think that that's maybe always the healthiest way to live life um so anyway i've kind of come down to the camp of like the one thing that i feel is magically ethical is using magic to basically try to communicate with hga slash diamond okay cool um and seeing that being as a kind of um psychopomp um as a way to kind of communicate it's like intuition basically but you know you could call it that let's say yeah um uh, but basically it's kind of like an interpreter between yourself and a higher power other people would say it's almost like that's yourself yeah that's more you know? the camp i'm in yeah, I can't believe you're in that camp at all. I can't believe you're in any <laughs> camp. But um, it, just this idea that you're you're using magic to kind of, you know, people meditate like this. They journal for this purpose as mm. well. It's like, well, well, if I don't, um, if I'm not using it to get uh, the shiny new car or something like that, can I at least get it to tell me, um, you know, uh, <laughs> something about like what I need in this life? Um, can I get it to tell me some answers? It's more like a listening tool yeah. rather than telling the universe to conform to your will. I talked to lots of people who are now atheists or agnostics or skeptics or whatever, or all three, um, who have had experiences where God has spoken to them in the past in prayer and stuff. And they now say, obviously that happened. Like I heard a voice or I felt a voice or I, you know, a thought popped into my head that didn't seem to be mine. But now I just interpret that as a different part of myself, like my subconscious mm -hmm. or whatever. And I think if you think of it that way, that makes perfect sense to me. Like, like you say, listening, getting quiet and thinking very hard about something and maybe doing some ritual acts to put yourself in an appropriate mood and then seeing what comes up for you. That sounds yeah. like self therapy. And, yeah. And to get to a wiser decision, like even if it's something very basic, like I have to act because I'm in this material world. So I, I basically have to, I'm not checking out just yet. Um, and if I have to act, what's the best way to act? And I think that that just being a question is, um, it's it's good to kind of get quiet for something like that and maybe it starts looking a bit like a, a magical ritual even though for you it's um communicating with something a higher part of you or yeah um actually thinking about it in a sort of therapeutic lens that makes me think about the chaos magic boys and how what they're doing is kind of like ritualized cbt because mm -hmm. in cbt you look at your beliefs that are not serving you like yeah. you might think i'm unworthy because everyone told you that when you're a child thanks mother or something like that. I don't know. Um, people have crazy ideas. And you pick about that idea. And the idea eventually is to cancel that belief, right? Yeah, because yeah. It's, it's not true. It's irrational. And we talked about this in the Stoicism episode. Um, so if you, can, if you can use ritual and, you know, smells and actions and all that stuff to make that a bit more, like to gamify your CBT, mm -hmm. I don't see any harm in that. I actually think that could be super valuable. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, I'm glad we found some use. Shall we um, start talking about some harms, benefits of magic? Yeah. Um, the big harm, the big obvious harm that seems almost too obvious to say, but I will say it because I'm the skeptic, is that if you're using magic to address real world serious problems, like you have a disease or you have no she's, money. She's playing the or, cancer card again. Yeah, exactly. If you're doing that instead of taking action, that's really bad. Um, also, if you're doing that when your friend is like, oh, I'm having a really hard time, I'm, um, I'm broke, and you're like, well, I could offer to lend her some money, or I could just do a spell. That's a bit of a dick move also, because yeah. you don't think of it as a dick move because you believe in magic. So there's a potential danger in thinking that magic can solve your problems because it cannot solve your problems. I really think that all the evidence suggests is that ritual can help you change your mood and be a more thoughtful person and maybe do some self-development stuff. I don't think you can make changes in the real world and I think if it could, then the world would be a very, very different place. So that, that is my major skeptical, like red lights flashing. Please everyone be aware of this. 
concern. Yeah, I um, I don't think we're powerful enough to do as much as people might think we can do. Um, I certainly, I've stopped believing in the whole law of attraction stuff because I think I thought I had more power. <laughs> actually, <too. laughs> um, But I do think there's an awful lot we can still do with magic. And um, I think, like you said, psychologically, I think it's probably very helpful. And I think potentially it could actually be helpful spiritually as well, depending on what mm. we use it for. I'm kind of surprised that therapists haven't cottoned on to this because if you go to a therapist, generally, in my experience, you just go and sit in a room on a chair and talk to a person wearing like a suit or just normal clothes. But what if they were wearing a hat? Exactly. What if they were wearing a hat? The other main harm that like it started to come in, I started to think about more when I was reading the KLF book, which is, um, it seems like a lot of people get into chaos magic specifically, although maybe ceremonial ceremonial magic generally kind of go a bit mental like they have mental health problems um specifically schizophrenia he mentions that this is not uncommon in these people this is interesting do you think it's like um something similar with uh, a lot of these psychedelic drugs it's like the some cases that might have had latent schizophrenia get yeah. called out when we do these things yeah and I, I mean that's the thing chaos magic goes hand in hand with psychedelics so it's mm. almost impossible to tell the other the other possibility is people who tend to be on that sort of schizotypal range which is like a it's not as bad as it sounds it's just a sort of personality yeah. type um wake up is the episode if you want to go find out more information about that um and we talk about it there, but uh, are more they're overrepresented in people who believe in woo and the mm -hmm. paranormal. Yeah. So if you've got this situation where people who are already prone to it are more attracted to it and mm -hmm. they take loads of drugs, then you could see how something like that might happen. It might not be the chaos magic's fault. Then again, I was reading this. Um, there was I googled, "Can you make yourself schizophrenic?" Which yeah, is good, a fun thing to question. Google. Um, and there was someone, um, I don't have this in front of me, but it was on Quora, and the guy was saying that he had Munchausen's, which is basically when you convince other people you're sick to get attention. Mm. Um, so he decided he was going to convince everyone he was schizophrenic. Was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Look into this. Um, he decided he was going to convince everyone he was schizophrenic. And to do that, he tried to generate the symptoms of schizophrenia in himself. Um, so what he did is he made himself sleep deprived. He spent a lot of time like just staring at white walls um, with no sensory input. And he started listening very, very hard to background. You know, like sometimes you'll hear like, uh, a radio in the next house over and you can't quite make it out he would start to deliberately try and make out words in that and he says and this is just some dude on the chorus so for what it's worth that he actually found he started experiencing hearing voices and thinking in a very disconnected jumbled way and he now thinks he has schizophrenia because he started doing i mean these are like the a lot of the instructions for doing chaos magic are kind of along these lines i don't necessarily think you can make yourself schizophrenic but i think it's plausible that you could probably experience some of the symptoms of schizophrenia and that could be very scary and unpleasant so it's yeah something yeah. to be cautious about yeah listeners word of warning don't become schizophrenic if you can help it yeah Otherwise, if you if you feel. find yourself you googling are. can you make yourself schizophrenic don't follow the instructions you find so what do you think do it again. Would you do the candle magic thing again? Are you going to pick up your old witch's hat and broom and shit? Should <laughs> I, other people do it? I don't think so, but I think I, I think I would encourage other people to do it. And I think we should think, think seriously about this idea of doing our own magical workshop that focuses on how, as someone who doesn't believe in the sort of supernatural explanation of magic, how they could maybe play around with some of these ideas and how, you know, they could make their own rituals and stuff. I think that'd be really a fun project to do. So if listeners are interested, maybe they could give us an email or something. Yeah, we're going to link to a um, website where you can give us your email. If you want to keep like, in the loop about whether we're going to do this or not, um, if we get enough of you showing interest, um, and maybe you can also email us at hello at seekerandskeptic.com. And let us know what you would want to learn in a crazy workshop between a seeker and the skeptic about magic. Yeah, because we haven't had time to talk about it in this episode, but I've been experimenting with this stuff with the idea of 
uh, of skeptical magic and um, how that might work. I've been hanging out on a Reddit forum called SAS Witches, S A W S Witches, which I recommend anyone who's interested to check out. It's a skeptical, science seeking, agnostic, or athic atheist witches but not in that order obviously because that doesn't spell the acronym (laughs) you kids and your acronyms yeah we love our acronyms um so yeah i think that this has potential and i think it'll be really fun to explore and Mm -hmm. what i've been doing i in this workshop i'll tell people what i've been up to and whether it's been working and you can experiment with some stuff too and we can hopefully share it I think we're both doing some weird shit and we haven't even revealed any of that on this episode yeah. and it'll be fun to do that in a, like a little community of a little private workshop where the general public who listen to our podcast can't see us right so <laughs> come join yeah. our coven is what we're saying basically yeah and you can find more information about that at seekerskeptic.com yeah and yeah so I guess just to summarize this rather long episode um <laughs> like I said I, I do actually already um, incorporate magical rituals I think in the last couple of years realizing that this was something that was needed in my life um, I have an altar uh, I send emails at auspicious times um, I light a candle every morning I pray or meditate um, and I use active imagination to attempt to contact my daimon um, I'll get into more in that of, about that in the course but um, I clearly am using magic and enjoying it <laughs> yeah and I'm um I'm embarrassed about what I'm doing. So it's I guess so much. You, it's way more. Whatever I just listed, it's 10 times more. I don't have an altar. I just have a windowsill that has a rock on it. Um, but I do get up to some weird shit uh, that I'm not going to share with you guys now. <laughs> but I will be happy to. And I think generally, like, this has been a really interesting experience for me as a skeptic. Um, and generally, the podcast overall is mm. because it has changed my perspective on this stuff. And I'm starting to see value in things that I really never thought I'd see value in. So that's pretty fucking cool. That is cool. (laughs) All right. Peace out. Bye. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know with a tweet or an email. We'd really love to hear about your experiences. Yes, please tell us what we got wrong. You can email us at hello at seekerandskeptic.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at seekerskeptic. You'll find the show notes for this and every episode at seekerandskeptic.com. And if you're interested, you can find my skeptically themed comics at rebeccaonpaper.com or follow me on Twitter at rebeccaonpaper. And I'm at yoga underscore astrology on Twitter. And you can find me exploring the intersection of yoga and astrology at yogaandastrology.com. If you liked what you heard and fancy supporting the show and spreading the word, we'd really appreciate a rating and review in the Apple Podcast Store or wherever you're listening. Or just tell somebody you know about the show. Thanks for listening.